Reader Mail. Number six. Hello and welcome to Triangle Square Day PlayStation Podcast. I'm your host, Brett, back and alongside me, Mr. Saw Bridges, bringing you guys lucky reader mail number six. For all those that don't know, we ask you guys to ask us questions on Twitter, Facebook, Discord, YouTube, all the places you can find us. And uh, every other Friday, you guys get a reader mail episode where we answer all those questions. So be sure to be following us on our Facebook group, Triangle Square Day PlayStation Podcast, uh, at Twitter at Triangle SQRD. Our Discord, which we always have linked in the videos, and uh, we also ask you guys on Patreon to ask us questions as well. And of course, if you have a good question for us on YouTube, let us know. We will favor that, and uh, it'll be answered on the show if it's one we're answering. We're not going to answer all YouTube questions in case they ever get crazy, so just a heads up there. And uh, now that I said that, I forgot we do have one to go answer, so i got to go find that real quick. But okay. Brad, tell, us who, <clears throat> tell, them, tell them who we normally are. Well, you can normally find us on Mondays at 10 a.m., PST 12 PM CST, uh, where we go over the news of PlayStation and uh, our thoughts on different topics that we do every week. So you can find us over there. <clears throat> if you like what we're doing on YouTube, subscribe so you can get these notifications and hit the little bell thing so you can see when our videos go live every Monday and then every other Friday, which is when these reader mails like here hit. But the patrons get it days early. Shout out to our patrons who support us. We love y'all. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so by clicking down the link in the description. Uh, but with that said, one thing, Saul, that I want to think about is... Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Maybe we don't have one on YouTube. We don't. I okay. thought we did. I thought World End asked us one on YouTube. No, wait. We definitely have one, and I'll get to it. I, um, and I'll, I'll have to find it because you have to go into the studio thing. It's a lot easier to do it that way. Gotcha. I'm also <laughs> giving us fake views. But uh, should you? Uh, do you think we should make a Discord channel that has a uh, chat specifically for asking us questions? That way we can go there easily and read them? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think Discord's going to have more lenient rules on terms of that, though, because... Just like Facebook, we can have people submit 150 questions. That doesn't mean we'll get to all of those. That's true. Uh, those are more rapid-fire questions that Kiki and um, Donovan do. And every now and then, I know Blake's done a couple that he wants to, wanted answered somewhat quickly. So that is never a big issue for me. Um, just so you yeah, guys Yeah, we know. definitely have one from World Okay, Day. yeah, it's actually on the Reader Mill uh, episode. So for those that don't know, there is no... Um, a limit to where you can ask us a question. Just make sure it's a somewhat newer video. I'd say within the past two or three weeks of us recording each reader mail, ask us one on uh, Triangle Squared episode, reader mail, or any other stuff we may have out. All right, but let's go ahead and get into it. We've we've uh, we waxed start with start poetic. with Facebook. Uh, yeah, we're going to start with Facebook and go through those. So right now, let's see. Mister Donovan asked us in one of his uh, couple of questions uh, together. If y'all had to pick a game to platinum between Fallout Six uh, Seventy Six and The Surge, which would you pick? These two games are specific because we've not played Fallout 76 at all. Death? And Saul, takes, Saul makes fun of the Surge all the time. I think it was a eh game. Like, it's not great, but it wasn't bad. It just wasn't enough for... It wasn't <clears throat> varied enough for one to pull me through it. But I outside think, of that, I mean... I think Death. Uh, probably the Surge because it would crash less. That's the, I, Again, I haven't played Fallout 76, so I don't know. This is just going off of stories I've heard. But I think the Surge is a little Do more in my, in my line anyway. Nah, say somebody gave them to you. Okay, Fallout then. All right, good. We're, we stand opposed. Uh, next up, Donovan's second little question he asked in a group. What Kingdom Hearts world is your favorite and why? Does Twilight Town count? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's an original world or a okay. Disney world. I didn't know if he was considering only Disney worlds. I would say anything. You know, if it doesn't matter if it's a Disney world or an original world. It's still a Kingdom Hearts world, essentially. Technically, but, yeah. I mean, do you want to do an answer for both? Do you want to have one? Or, or is Twilight Town it anyway? Twilight Town and then... Um... All, all because of that lazy afternoons. Yeah. That's it. Man, what is the world, the destroy, like the destroyed style world in 2 where you fight Sephiroth? Oh, it's Hollow Bastion. End. Oh, yeah. When you're going through the crystal I'm area. always trying to think that, yeah. I'm always, <clears> for some reason, think it's the, uh, the the world in between worlds or whatever it's called. What oh, the that? world that never was, was is the... Um, the finale of one. The f no, no, that's the, that's the finale of two. That's where you actually go up, and oh. it's it's where the organization's base is. What's the finale of one's uh, world? But I mean, it's Hollow Bastion. Technically, yeah. well, but, no, no, no. One's is like the I'm talking like a little dream end like, of the world. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, the end of the world. I think it's called the end of the world, where you have to like go through. And yeah, like, that's in it. Floating sky. Well, there's like no floor, and you can't yeah. see, and you have to like walk that, through. That, that area sucks. Yeah, I, I mean, I like that area. It's kind of fun. 
where you have to fight old Chernabog. That boss fight's hard. It's very similar to the Ursula boss fight. I mean, yeah, but he, like, I'm trying to think of what his attacks were because I do know, like, you can hide through most of them when he's behind you, or you can go behind him. Yeah, kind of. He does like, the same thing because one of the things that Ursula has in Kingdom Hearts 1, I'm sure if you've played it, then you probably remember this. Uh, she did this thing where she calls down like lightning bolts and she'll do that even when you go behind her. So it's like you have to constantly stay and in he motion. did like, what was it, meteors? I think he was fire-based. Yeah. Fire like, or fireballs? Yeah. yeah. It's been a little while since I've played one, actually. I haven't had it near as much time, um, but I still love yeah, the game. Yeah, that's a difficult boss for me. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's that one. <clears throat> Twilight Town for you or... The, Twilight or Town Hollow, or the Bastion. Hollow Bastion, yeah. Hollow Especially Bastion. Especially new Hollow Bastion. In the second game, yeah. when you get to go to it, yeah. Uh, Hollow Bastion is a good answer across the board because it's so different depending on whether you're looking at it in Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep when it's the original Hollow Bastion. Yeah. Uh, and technically, without spoiling too much, I guess technically it's that in three, you know. Well, yeah. It's, it's Somewhat. back to that castle uh, where all that stuff goes down. So uh, there's that. I would say for me... I have a weird fondness just because I like how uniquely done it was. I think that the uh, Timeless River was really cool in Kingdom Hearts 2. I like the idea. It, it's one of those worlds that you got to go. It was so different because not only did it change the way that you looked as a character, and it was cool seeing Sora in that old-timey cartoon style, but it was also like all the music went away. The like it, They had a filter over the voice acting. There was silent, they, like, you know, there were silent people it was, there. It was, it, there was no, like... It when, felt when like acting, an old was, cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. And it was just, I like the idea of moving through the little things. And its story relevance was kind of interesting, going back in time for the Cornerstone of Light thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I, that's that's one of them. I think the world that never was is another great answer. I think it's a really cool looking world. And it was also one of my favorite worlds to go through and do uh, grinding in game when you're trying to level up all your forms and get your form levels throughout your standard one. So, you know, if you level up in Kingdom Hearts 2, if you level up your forms while you're in them, you get some of those abilities transferred over to your normal character. So you get yeah. the ability to glide and all that. And I thought that was awesome. Um, so that's what I would normally run through. And I would use that. And I would also train uh, for specifically the drive limit things to get those leveled up at Mulan. Because what you could do is you could start in the throne room thing, the little hallway that leads to the throne room. Uh, you can go drive fight everything that's in there, go outside, fight everything that's out there, and then you have just enough time to get back up. And the original game, I haven't tried this in the remix yet, or whatever the HD remixes, uh, but in the original game on PS2, you had enough time to get back up to the save point, and if you were still in drive form when you hit a save point, it refilled your drive fully, so you didn't have to wait. So you got it back again, yeah. Yeah, and you could just endlessly train, and that's how I leveled up all my stuff for the most part. But uh, yeah, those are good ones. Good questions. Love Kingdom Hearts. Uh, let's see. Next question comes from Josh Soup. What are your ideal toppings on a hamburger? Cheese. Mine's super simple. But I say super. I mean, it's it's not even really weird. Mine is, I'll tell you what my burger is in general. When I go anywhere that lets me create my own burger, which is essentially where the only places I go, is I want my burger to be medium. I want my cheese to be preferably provolone and Swiss. Sometimes you don't get both because places won't carry both for some reason. So I have to do Swiss and cheddar or provolone and cheddar. Right. Um, I'll do that occasionally. <clears throat> then I want bacon on it and an over hard egg. Every now and then I'll do an over easy egg, but it's so messy that you still get all the flavor from the over hard and it tastes good while not being as messy. Yeah. And then I stack some French fries on top of all that and then put some ketchup on it. And that's your perfect burger right there. Yeah, I'm pretty simple. I like cheese, jalapenos, and bacon. That's my go to right there. Um, weirdly enough, I've never seen you get a jalapeno on a burger, but I guess that's, you you haven't been attention. Is that attention. what you get at 30 Burger? No, I get the a uh, thirty burger, burger. Burger. I get the uh, what is it called? Um, it's the one that they used to have the challenge out of. Oh yeah, the the apocalypse. Yeah, it's the apocalypse, which that is, um, it's a bacon patty with cheese, an egg over easy with uh, pulled pork and sliced pork barbecue, and that's that's my go-to there I, I typically leave the egg off though because it is very messy already and that just makes it like half yeah. eaten with a fork but yeah yeah pretty much cheese bacon jalapenos is my go-to thing all right Saul Josh ask again in his little rapid fire what's your favorite Disney movie of all time I'm having a hard time thinking of any Disney movie right now for some reason no nah, man this one's hard gonna go with my Toy gut Story. though I mean technically that doesn't really count though does it yeah Disney Pixar I, yeah. I'd count it 
I want to I want to stick with Disney proper just because, uh, yeah. and I like to. Uh, Treasure Planet is a Treasure phenomenal Planet's movie. So much, and my, I'm I've never been like I'm continually disappointed every time I watch the movie that it did not get a sequel. When a sequel is in the works, they they scrapped it because the movie did not perform well at all. And I don't know why. It's I mean it's a fantastic movie. Uh, and there was two movies that came out very close in time that had a similar situation, but Atlantis did better. But Atlantis is another great Disney movie that is so different from the rest of the pack in a way that I, it, it's a unique I idea. I forgot Atlantis even. But Treasure see. Planet, man, there was some crazy stuff they used for Treasure Planet. Treasure Planet was really cool. The, was it Michael J. Fox the main voice actor? No, it's Jordan uh, J- Joseph Gordon-Levitt. In Treasure Planet? Yeah, he was the main kid. And it actually looked just like him, so I'm surprised you have a hard time believing that. Treasure Planet. Yeah, Treasure Planet. I Joseph think, Gordon-Levitt. Am I thinking of the wrong movie? Yeah, the where he the kid, the kid on the windsurfer in the beginning of the movie, and he's flying around, and literally he's going to a planet that has treasure. It's got the uh, robot they meet later in the movie. Tell you me, said that looks like Joseph Gordon Levitt when he was young. And first of all, that's not go to the actual like in the movie thing. You can find him. It looks that's like right a, there. That yeah, does. that looks like a young Joseph Gordon Levitt. Not to me, it does. They ba- that was the time around when they try and base your characters around what the character look like or, or what the human. They still do that in games. Wasn't that just like a futuristic adaptation of Treasure Island? Yes, absolutely okay. is what it was. Uh, but look, there was this thing, and I can't remember exactly what it was called, uh, but it was a really intensive 3D technology that Disney had developed for um, Tarzan. So the way that it worked out is that in Tarzan, do you remember the scene uh, whenever Tarzan's running around on the, uh, he's like sliding around technically on the uh, vines and like the tree trunks. And it does like this that real trans- crazy like, depth yeah, motion thing. Transition effect to each shot. That That's like that essentially too. the only part of that movie that uses that kind of technology. I can't remember what it was called, uh, but Treasure Planet used that for the majority of the movie and it was incredibly expensive. Treasure Planet also had the coolest like set of McDonald's toys or yes, Burger King toys. I forgot which one it was, but you'd put together the, the you actually put together the spear, the sphere. Mm-hmm. Yes, and yes, yes. it came in four pieces. And once you had it together, it showed a light on the ceiling that had the map. Yeah, that, I'm telling you, man. Great time. Did you ever play the Treasure Planet game that was on GameCube and PS2? Nope. Really I surprisingly think, I, a good licensed game. I think Not Chase Grown Up had it. Like, I great. remember seeing gameplay of it. And I know that was way before a time of me getting on the internet to look at games and sure. stuff. All right, let's see. Oh, man, there's all sorts of weird stories about that I can go into forever. I think that movie's so crazy. The people who made it literally only got to make it because they both of the co-directors directed a bunch of other movies that Disney wanted them to do first. Yeah. And Disney essentially let them make that movie as a way to pacify them for all the other stuff they did. And it sucks that it didn't do well, but alas, I guess it's a better fate. I'll give it this. I guess it's a better fate than Atlantis getting a sequel that was direct to DVD. You remember that? Atlantis 2. I didn't even know there was an Atlantis 2, no. It was a straight-to-DVD or straight-to-tape, whatever you want to call it at the time. Uh, All right, next question. Josh asked in his final little thing, pineapple on pizza, a blessing or a blasphemy? Nope, just I've never had it. I think we answered this last episode, oddly enough. Are you reading old questions? No. No, but I think Kiki asked it, oddly. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. Look, I don't care for it. I get the argument that it's doing something sweet against something salty because, like I said, this typically goes on Canadian bacon, so that's a Hawaiian pizza. And the Canadian, we definitely answered this last episode because we talked about Canadian bacon. Yeah. Um, See, now for me, I would have to have. Um, well, it's supposed to be that the the saltiness of the ham of the Canadian bacon is supposed to go really well with the very the tart sweetness of the pineapple. Oh, Michael I J. don't Fox. agree with it. Michael but. J. Fox is the voice of the Atlantis. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So that's like, I knew one of them, but yeah. Like, yeah, unless hey, somebody you're, bought you're the pretty, pizza. Pretty, pretty girl. P- pretty good. P- p- yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and, love that movie. As a, <clears throat> if somebody bought the pizza and I didn't have to spend money on it, I'd give it a try, but I haven't tried it. So, like, I'm never around somebody who has that kind of pizza, and I'm not going to waste my money on it in case I dislike it because pineapple, it seems like it's acidic to the point like where you could pick the pineapple off and there's still going to be some of that acidity left behind. Kind of like a pickle. Like, yeah. When, when, and I'm not... If you like pickles, that's fine. But when you go somewhere and you ask them not to put a pickle on a sandwich and then they do and they go, well, just take it off. You're like, no, that's not how that works, partner. That is not how that works at all. Pickles are juicy. They literally sit in vinegar all the time. When you put them on something that's bready, it absorbs into the bread. You cannot just take a pickle off. You're still going to taste the pickle. The only thing you're going to avoid at that point would be the crunchiness of the pickle. Yeah. And it's like, well, I mean, if I'm going to taste the pickle anyway, I might as well just deal with the damn pickle. That's the best part about the pickle, the crisp. I, I hate pickles. I love pickles. Ugh. 
I put those on a burger every now and then when I'm feeling adventurous. This is a great question, by the way, and it's from somebody who's never asked a question, Mr. Jeff Schrock, so thank you for asking the question. Thank you. Uh, and it's a good question. I can't believe nobody's asked this yet. Definitely knowing your affinity for the series and the fact that I, I still love the series, what's your favorite Metal Gear villain? Ooh, that is a good one. Can I cheap out and say Revolver Ocelot because of his <laughs> redemption arc? Sure. I mean, or could I? Yeah, look, it comes see, down so to it comes down to a. It, it comes, doesn't matter why is he your favorite villain. It doesn't matter why. His it, redemption it, arc. It, seeing him in three. Well, that's what I'm getting. So it doesn't matter. He's not saying that they have to be your favorite villain from a gameplay standpoint. It's just like whatever your favorite villain is for, for whatever reason. I think that's a good one. I think I think he's my favorite villain overall because I don't of, want to say too much. I don't know if you're about to get into it. But. No, no, I was just gonna say because of his story arc that he has, starting from three and ending with four. Conveniently, there's like four games in the between there of him, <laughs> like uh, yeah, of him, but. uh yeah, no, that's a that's a really good answer. Revolver and that's Ocelot. one of the best parts of Metal Gear Solid Four. I will say my best boss fight though is the end in Metal Gear Solid Three. Okay, so that's that's I my favorite boss that. fight of the series. Either that one or there's one that I mine is going to go to, but it's still because of how much of an impact it had on me as a kid, and I think that's true for a lot of Psycho people. Psycho Manus. Psycho Manus. Yeah, I was and that's say it's just that because Psycho Manus. to this day, and nobody has really bothered to or do twin this. snakes. But that's also because why would you at this point? You know what I mean? Wait, well, like, why would you copy that? Now I'm trying to think. Was well, Psycho Manus was Twin Snakes, right? No, Psycho Manus was in the first game on PS One. That's twin or Twin Snakes. Twin Snakes is the remake of the first yeah, game, but I mean, you could, I mean. he was still in the PS One. Well, well, that's that's where I played it. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Are you telling me, have you never played Mega Solid 1 on the PS1? No, I went back and played that. But I, you played well, it first as Twin Snakes? Yeah, I played it first as Twin Snakes. I did not know that. Yeah. That's I, not surprising because I, I remember and, you didn't have a PS1. Yeah, I played it unethically. Unethically. <laughs> okay. No, but yeah, Psycho Madness was cool from a, like a gameplay perspective. The end was really, really cool from like a mechanical way to defeat him. Yes. Uh, I love that one. Yeah, and then uh, Revolver Ocelot's my favorite because of the way... For story reasons. Yeah. I, I'll give you that. Especially... Never mind. I'm not gonna say anything about four. I know it's it's so hard. And I mean five. You know what I'll say right now? Oh, okay. I must say because four was free um, for February. I think is what it was. The the last month that they did PS3 games. So if you had a PS3 or hopefully you at least had the foresight to just nab it. If you've never played Metal Gear Solid Four and you liked Metal Gear Solid, like, even if you started with five, go back and play four just to see how different it is more than anything. But I would say play them in I, I, not in order, but don't play four without playing any of the other ones. Four is a. Here's the thing about four. The reason that four is so split in terms of the fan base and it, the way that people view it is that that game is pure fan service. Pure fan service. It's amazing and I love it. But the game solely rests on we're just going to do everything that Metal Gear Solid fans that we think Metal Gear Solid fans would just love from. But and it's awesome and I love it because of it. But I get that that's a little bit why some people hated the fact that it was really cutscene heavy and long. But it had a ton of story. I don't think ton. in the entirety of four that there was a one given boss battle that I thought was just really 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 cool. And that's what I was about to say. As much as I love four as from its moment to moment gameplay was great. I loved it. The opt you know the uh, what. The optic camouflage or whatever that would change, uh, omni camouflage. Yeah, omni camouflage. Thank you. That was awesome. I, I love think that. What it's called? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I liked all of the weird things they introduced into that was cool, and the way that they made the games far more cinematic when they were already known to being cinematic on the PS2, and even the PS1 one was doing a lot of odd stuff that wasn't liked at the time. Uh, Octo camo. Octo camo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For some reason, I really thought it was omni. I don't know why. Uh, when you said it, I thought that's it. But, I think Omni is something else in the series that I did escaping me right now. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, the end was really cool, but like I said, yeah. Psycho Man is from just a perspective of like breaking the fourth wall kind of thing was really really cool. Okay, so we got more. Do you want to sneak in a couple of ones from Twitter and the in the break in between going to the next uh, Facebook post? Sure, I'll throw in a good one from uh, our good buddy Sean One Knee over there on Twitter. Once I uh, pull it back up, because once again. Twitter's updated their web browser and or not web browser but web app and it's just terrible. Uh, Sean One Neo says, "Where'd it go? There we go. What is the best TV ad you can remember for a video game?" Didn't he just ask this? That one shouldn't be on today. No, it should. Did this he is ask Reader that? Six. Did, okay, I thought he asked that Monday. M Monday should have been Reader Mail Seven. Oh well. I just don't want to answer ones that are... Oh, yeah. So technically, I'm going to throw that one in the vault. Sorry, Sean, but I will replace that question with... I know you asked one more. Sean, where's your questions at, my man? Maybe not. 
<laughs> Sean, I thought you had more questions. Anyways, let's go well, ahead just go on to the Facebook fine. one. Fine. Look, Saul, Sean, well, Saul I, I, doesn't sorry, know how to work the Twitter. Sorry to tease. All right. Uh, let's see. Going to Mr. Josh Drago. He said, did Saul play that song from Far Cry 5 at the wedding? What song from Far Cry 5? Song from Far Cry 5? I'm curious. Is this like... I don't know. Huh. Song from Far Cry 5. I'm I, trying to think of what would be the song. Yeah, me too. That would be keen to a Is there a wedding song in 5? Josh, I hate to tell you, buddy. I don't know if I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Like, I really... I'm, I'm, that, that kind of threw me through a loop. I, I honestly don't know. Are they original? Was it an original song? You're going to have to give us some little bit more information and we'll give you an answer for we'll it. We'll expound but upon sadly, it. Sadly, I, I don't know it. Uh, let's see. Mr. Donovan Williams asked a little four burst questions. If you win $1,000 a day per life in the lottery, what would you spend your time doing? Uh, it may sound crazy. Essentially, I would I would go back to doing music so I actually have time. I wouldn't have to worry about working. Uh, but I would spend a couple hours a day. I would, I, would split, I would split the way I work right now. I would say, okay... I work 10 hours. I would say four to five hours I'm going to put towards doing music relatively every day. And then the other four to five hours I'm going to put towards being able to do more of this. So if it's both of us, I would like to imagine that within reason, we've talked about it before. Like I, we both would like to do this full time if we could. Yeah, full time there would be, I would, I would say probably four to maybe five things weekly that would go on that is a podcast of some sort. So a couple of those and then streaming. Is what I is what my intended. And I, honestly, if I had more time and the ability, because I mean, just you get so stretched. Definitely, when you have a family and a kid, you got to take care of. But uh, if I had more time, I would actually do more videos that actually involve some like interesting editing and stuff like that. Uh, I might even I might even just screw around with the camera and figure out how to do something a little more off the cuff than what we've done. You See, know. and I'd probably end up writing more articles. I already have another one that I'm going to work on here probably later on <clears> tomorrow <throat> night. That's that that process is always like not slow for me, but it's not the fastest thing in the world. But like that Dark Souls article I wrote was like forty five minutes of writing, I think, or an hour. I have another answer, but <laughs> you know, I was gonna say I, it, it, that that's kind of one of those things that like I've almost talked to myself about. So yeah, I got you. Well, I would say I would actually go down a little bit, cut those both down to like you know four hours each, and then the extra two hours I get out of that go to playing games that are in my backlog that I haven't been able to get to yet. Well, I think that no matter what, like, That's one of those even good if things. we recorded... It would give me a little bit more personal time, which would be nice. I think even if we recorded eight hours a day of stuff, we, there's still plenty of time sure. there, like normal, like a normal work day. Sure. Yeah. But, it, well, yeah, because essentially, if you started doing this stuff in work time, it wouldn't be happening on our free time. So you'd get your free time get back. Your free time back, yeah. yeah. And then we could start, like, we could do something crazy, like where we start at 6 a.m. recording, and then we're done by, like, 3. And then you have from 3 instead of 5, plus all that extra time of the day that you would Boy. also. Have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be sweet. Oh, well, we can we can always dream. Next question from him. If you had to choose a new podcast name, what would it be? Well, ha, 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 ha. Ah, yeah, you're not going to find that one out. Hold who, on. Who asked that one? This is Donovan, but I think he's actually talking about for this. So I'm going to throw out just a snippet of the, the history of how we en- ended up landing on this. This was actually... We were doing the test episode where we didn't even have a name. It was, and it was, Saul's talked about it. It was like literally a short thing where we were just trying to see how cameras worked, how the audio would work, how we'd go about doing everything, and if we could even do it in front of a camera without issue. Yeah. So when we doing that, we, of course, we were just talking out of our ass and reading some stuff and just like, well, could we do this? And Saul just like randomly blurts out, uh, hey, welcome to Triangle Squared. And that's, well, it's something we had talked about before, but we were seeing how, like, but we never, very briefly, yeah, but, but and we you, would see how it roll off the tongue. Yeah, and you kind of just said it, and then we still didn't even land on it right then. It went through a lot of logo trying, like, well, if we were going to choose a name, what would the logo be? And we almost had the name Select Start. And I still think as a backup, I like that one. So like start would be like, and we had a cool logo for it and a cool intro for yeah, it. Yeah, because I had like the idea for select start. Like I would, I couldn't use GIMP back then. Um, I don't even know if I could now, honestly, for something like that. Just maybe I could. But anyways, I had I had like an idea for that in my head. I had an idea for this logo, which actually is nowhere near what that is because my mine turns out is really really bad for the logo behind us. Like mine was pretty much a fusion of of a triangle and a square with the name. And then when Brett showed me. How it can how triangle could be to the right of the triangle or yeah, yeah the word triangle could be to the right of the symbol and then the square uh, squared could be to the right of the square symbol 
And I was like, that looks a lot better than mine. Um, yeah, and this is technically our second logo. So if you've well, it's, it's joined an, it's us a, recently, but it's like an evolution. It's of a the revision same. of the first one almost. Kind of. Yeah, it's, it's a little more fanciful. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Good question, though. Yeah, Let's very see. Question. Next question from Donovan Zilberis. Can we expect more immersive worlds on the PS5 or... Are we going to fall into the media trend of being forced to crank out games more quickly to satisfy the market resulting in games of lesser quality? Games are not going to be, by first party studios, games are not going to be cranked out anyway. They're going to take longer to develop than current games, I would exactly. imagine. So and to, to support that point before you move on to the next one, if there's one, that's exactly why Sean Layden was talking about how E3 doesn't work anymore because their games are taking longer to do because they're wanting them to be bigger and more ambitious. Mm -hmm. So those longer development cycles now mean that it's harder for them to reach a point where they can reveal something every year and then actually get something out every year to where it's easy to make a schedule. Yeah, so, so you're going to start seeing games bigger not only in the terms of size, like for the for the data they take, uh, but for, or for the size of the game file, but you're going to see it for the size of the worlds. The well, that's, and that's expensive. Everything. He does say immersive, just to... But, That's what I'm talking about. But they're both. I mean, I, I get where you're going to an extent. I think games can be more immersive because they're more expensive. Well, I'm just saying, but it doesn't always the work. The size either. of a game, whether you're talking about the the storage size or the game files or, or the game in game world, world size, yeah, re, the scope directly of the game. still like is is proof of how long it took to or not how long, but it it's it's I can't even speak. It's there to show you that yeah, this game took a while to make. To an extent, because I'm going to say this. Well, a massive, like, well-done open world that's... Well-done open world. That's the thing. It, well, it's, it's, it is... And we've already talked about how subjective those opinions name, are. But there are certain games where I'm like... From first parties. Yeah. I'm talking first, about strictly first parties. First parties, parties. Different. Now, he, strictly. he didn't say first party. This well, is just, just kind saying, of in general. Yeah, but. I'm saying first party just because that's what I know is going to happen. Sure. I don't want to speculate on second... Because I know second and third parties are going to have those games that are going to be really, really well done. However, I don't... Well, they're think, also going to have the ones that are really big that are just for quantity's sake. Right. Which and I then, hate. And then, of course, that is another problem that we're going to come across in 2-2 too, too, as, as well because I don't understand how we're going to have those games where they're going to be the size of, like, four Skyrim maps. And you're like, oh, that's cool. And then you get into them and it's the same content of one Skyrim map in that size. It's like, well, this is empty and waste or barren. Or, it's wasteland. yeah, it's either that or... It's set up to where it's it's a bunch of the same style of missions just to pad it out for no reason. And they're both bad. Yeah, they're both really, really bad. And those decisions have been made multiple, multiple times by different companies. And they will continue to be made that yeah, multiple, multiple, multiple times. But to go back to the idea of immersive real quick, I do think that we see really immersive worlds now. And I think... The thing about immersion is that there's a lot of things that can pull you in, and every game has different things. Some things can be music, oddly enough, will pull you in more than if you just didn't listen to it or hear it. Uh, sometimes yeah. it's the quality of the voice acting and how much they sell a character that doesn't even truly exist, and even, be it a real character or not. And then sometimes it's things like the the way the leaves fall and crunch beneath your feet. That's and, what I was going to say, ambient noises. Like yeah. Witcher 3 still has done something that no other game has done for me, except that one, and it is hanging out in the world and you're riding roach or whatever you're riding your horse or you're just walking around and then you hear the wind going through the trees yeah and it's the, it's that's a sound that i've not heard many games do that well and witcher 3 mm. nailed it and you know that's that goes in a sound is a, something that has gotten a lot more attention this generation for sure uh like the witcher 3 going back to that and there are other games it's not just the witcher 3 but uh the witcher 3 was a perfect early example of it uh earlier in the gen is where they actually want to sit there and make sure, like, when we're talking about immersion, immersion can be broken in a number of ways. Sometimes it could just be when you have a game that is so detailed in every small way that when you forget the one detail, it just comes off as weird and breaks the immersion. Yeah, um, I agree. And some of that can be like, if you have a game that has all these things that it does very realistically, and then for some reason you're running and you are and you have the same noise of you running on like or your feet in the you ground. Or even like a jaggy animation when you're running. Well, that's true. But I'm thinking like even when it comes to sound specifically, you know, have you ever had it to where you're running on grass and then you're running on concrete and then you're running on dirt and they all it's, sound they all the exact sound same. same? Yeah, it's I all the same that. exact sound file, whether you're running Ooh. over gravel, you're running over tall grass, short, or, I mean, that that's kind of And it depends on the game, again. Short. You know, when indie games do it like that, and that's not the show of what they're going for. Like realism is See, not what they're going for. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, it bothers a, me on games like let's say a game like Red Dead did that. Red Dead did not do that. But if Red Dead did do that, it would have been like, whoa, what? How did they skip out on that of all things? You know what I mean? <laughs> Speaking of Red Dead, I saw that earlier. Red Dead on the Switch. That how's that gonna work? Streaming, just like they did with Resident Evil Seven. Oh, okay. 
I don't know, actually. I mean, that's just my best guess. Um, but anything else you want to add to that? No, I think we I think we kind of got all the points across that I wanted to make. Okay. Uh, last one from him. What five games would you like to see made into an anime? This is a weird question. Take a game and adapt it into an anime. It's not that odd because you think about the fact that a lot of game series have been adapted into comic books, and it's not that much more I of know a I don't have an answer for this. Because I was going to say Dark Souls, and then I realized that's berserk. Bloodborne? Then you get an anime that's very, uh, but you, even even then there's there's Bloodborne like stuff in Berserk as well. Oh, okay, I haven't watched Miyazaki enough. loves Berserk, so he's drawn a lot of influences from Berserk. Okay. Um, well, I was just thinking of having something that was a little more love. Halo in, did in an anime, anime, you know, which would be something cool they would see, but they already did it. God of War wouldn't work. Infamous wouldn't really work. Maybe Infamous would actually work. Infamous might work. Um. Infamous already has that comic book style. I think translating that more into an anime would, would work. So, I mean. Destiny would be kind of cool. Like, they did it with Halo, and it works for Halo to an extent. I don't remember Halo having an anime, per se. I'm pretty sure they did. I think, it was, think it's been... Well, an- and what do we want to say as, as anime? You know, because technically anime is just animation. So we can run that across anything, but I'm assuming he's meaning in here something that's a little more geared towards the typical Japanese animation market. Yeah, that's pretty... That's oh. not real. But it's Halo Legends is what I think is what that is called, of what my head is thinking of. Yeah. Uh, Dead Space has already had it happen, too, with their little Dead Space movies that were really cool. Deadfall? What was that what it was called? Deadfall? Dead Space. Uh, yeah, actually, I think it was. Or Deadfall was one of the side games. I know that there was... Um, Dead Space, there was Downfall. That Maybe might be what, what we're talking about. Yeah. yeah, Halo Legends is pretty, pretty yeah. anime inspired. Yeah, see? It goes Dead Space, Downfall. Yeah. So like Resident Evil, I guess, would be kind of cool, but I feel like Resident Evil... Already- Resident Evil's been done with their movies, like uh, Revelations. I guess it's not huh? that weird of a question. Not Revelations, I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. The uh, CGI one with Claire and Leon. Leon, there's multiple of them, actually. There's... Uh, Resident I'm th- I'm Evil the Outbreak, I think is I, that's it. I think is that the one where it's it's like at an airport in the end, and like they're in an airfield. Oh, Outbreak is a game. Never mind, my bad. There is definitely a Resident Evil. I know what CGI it, movie, and I don't remember I've, what it's called. I, I, I owned it at one point, which is what's sad. There's Vendetta. It looks that's like that's not what it is. I don't think. Oh, here they are. The one I was thinking about was Degeneration. Then they did Damnation. I don't even think Degeneration was it. And then they did. Oh yeah, Vendetta. it might have actually been it. Yeah, Degeneration I've seen. That's the one that had Claire in it. That's the one that took place at like an airfield at the end, right? Or like an airport. I, honestly, I don't remember. I, I saw it back when it came out, but it's just been a long time. I'm about to control F this and just type in airport. Yeah, <laughs> man, control F you. The airport has been <laughs> locked down by a local special response team in the United States Marine Corps, aiding evacuated survivors. So yeah, mm. that's it. Okay. All I used right. to own that movie on DVD somewhere. All right, well, that's the last one of that little section. So hold on. Let me move up and see if there's anything else. Sure. I'll throw a quick Twitter question in there that it seems to be fun to answer. If you guys are offered an opportunity to appear on any podcast show, which one would it be and why? Love you guys. Ooh. Thank you, Kiki. Love you too. That's a hard hmm. one. Now, I do I do know that if I can stretch this question a little bit and be on any internet show, I'd be on Hot Ones. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Yeah, you want to tell people the great story of how you signed us up to hopefully get on the hot ones? Yeah, they had that little giveaway. Didn't happen. Didn't make it. Didn't make it. I didn't think so, but it's still, I could tell, A, it makes sense. Saul loves hot food. I do. Saul likes the idea I of catapulting our podcast into success by I don't putting care it in about front that. of a Honestly, I just, I just want to eat wings with Sean Evans Go and go through that experience. So, see if, how, if any of y'all know. Do you know, think you can get all the way through it? That's the question. You know, I think the bomb, which is the third from the last sauce, would really mess me up. It seems to mess even even a lot of good people up. So, yeah. Did you watch the one with John in Knoxville? No, nah, yeah, I watched the one with him. I've it's watched every good. single one of them that's come out actually, except um, except that sounds like that's not every single one of them. I was gonna say the Natalie the Portman, one. and it's because the Natalie Portman one. I was like watching it, and I felt sick. And I laid down. And I was like, I don't want to watch it anymore because it made me feel sick. <laughs> Natalie Portman makes me sick, even though she's a good actress, but. Uh, Shaq, see the bomb is is 
it's not the hottest. It's the third from the hottest, but it's almost like it tastes like battery acid is what everybody says. Oh, I and, do remember which one you're talking yeah, about. And Shaq was like, uh, he's like, where is this one from? And, and Sean was like, canvas. And Shaq was like, canvas don't know hot foods. And he took a bite out of it. Canvas? Made, Kansas. My bad. <laughs> okay, I was like. Kansas. And then he said, Kansas doesn't make hot food. And then he took a bite out of it, threw it away. And then he me looked at the camera and said, oh, I apologize, Kansas. <laughs> This is Shaq. <laughs> so, like, I would really love to be on that show. Um, but it, I, I guess to go back to a podcast, I guess I guess technically Joe Rogan would be fun I was going to say on. Joe Rogan because of the – the thing about it is I, I don't watch enough podcasts just because I don't have enough hours of the day. And I was talking to Blake about this last night when we were playing The Division. I like Joe because of the variety of people he has on. But the reason is that the variety of people he's had on has shown me how good of an interviewee he is. That That's it. That he would be it would, be, facilitate it would either be really funny from a comedic standpoint, or you might actually have a really interesting conversation and talk about weird things. That it's just I like I like what do you want to even call it? Engaging conversation. Yeah. And I also like just funny conversation. And I know he can pull off both. Right. So if we just kind of did, I, I think I'd be okay with it, with the people that I know. And I think that he's proven himself to be, even if you don't agree with his opinions, he's proven himself to be a pretty good host and the yeah. ability to press against his people uh, in a way that he, feels he, satisfying he most take, of the time. I he, mean, nobody's ever perfect, but right. You know. Well, I mean, even then, like for the most part, he can take just about any person that's come onto that show from any background or career and then facilitate a well, like a, a, a really well done conversation. He understands. Yeah. How to facilitate, how, how to get to. a conversation. Yeah, I was gonna say, to be it, doesn't, it doesn't happen every single episode but there's very rare instances when it doesn't I enjoy and even then he still does a good job of trying to yeah. get that conversation to go yeah good one alright let's see we have one here from Mr. Josh Ayers he asked what would it take for you to n- to never play PlayStation again boy that's just hot stakes uh, I mean probably nothing PlayStation not be around anymore Xbox did me real dirty so like I still like Xbox yeah I, 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 mean, I, I say like but I mean yeah I don't have a problem with Xbox what is you would play it yeah. It doesn't even matter if you really want to own one. This is going as far as saying that even if you were at your friend's house and he was like, hey, man, uh, I've got Diablo 4 on the PS5. You want to play it? And you go, what? Well, not, no. to, not to mention that, but like Xbox is coming out with some dope custom systems for giveaways and stuff. And like I was just thinking, I'm like, technically, I don't want to enter this giveaway because I don't want to like and retweet an Xbox account on our on our Twitter for PlayStation. I go to my I personal thought, account for well, it. Well, I thought about going to Nartech <laughs> for it, but... Um, it is probably the coolest looking and um, one of the coolest looking uh, custom consoles I've ever seen. And that goes even for the limited edition Xbox One X of Sekiro or Sekiro. Mm-hmm. Both the Xbox and the PlayStation Sekiro was really cool. The PlayStation one was pretty decent, but the Xbox one was one of the coolest. Uh, of, of Sekiro? Yeah, that was oh, the original I, I thought one. the I thought the PlayStation one looked cooler because of like the real sense no. of wood there. That was the Xbox one. No, I'm talking the about the Xbox one was the one we saw first. No, the PS4 Pro that was up on its side that had the you could see it was a PS4 Pro. That's not the one we saw first. And it had and it had the rope on it and the controller. That's the one I saw first. The one we saw that we were talking about on the podcast that one day was an Xbox. No, that was yes, it. it was. Whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter, but it wasn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. But they no, because you said what they're getting a PlayStation. We looked it up and you couldn't. We couldn't even enter to win it because you thought that you could buy it, and we went into all of that. But it doesn't matter. Um, I don't know. I guess my answer is genuinely. I think that. Oh yeah, you're right. This is the ugly one. It is the Xbox that's ugly, or not ugly, it, but it's it still not. It looks fine. The controller looks. The controller is way cooler. Ooh, boy, that would, yeah. <laughs> But the, uh, the console itself is, I mean, it's it, cool. It yeah. looks better than so, a normal Xbox. I apologize. I was wrong. But I will say there was a, a, an Xbox tweet, and I'm, I was trying to find it just to show you. But yeah, like, I have no, like, after what they did at E3 of what, 2012? 13. 13. Uh, was it 2013? Before they launched, yeah. That was their... Oh, that's right, because PlayStation launched first this gen. Yeah, but they, yeah. they were both in November. They were a week apart. Yeah. Um... But I would say that even after then, how dirty they did me and how like tired I was with the console and the system and the games and everything and how ma- how mad I was. You still ended up buying an Xbox One. You still had it for about eight months. Then you sold it. I had it for about two years. Man, we had that thing for that long. I had that thing for about that long. I had the Xbox One. Hold on. No. Well, you had it before us. That's why. That's why. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, what do you mean? I got you. My bad. My bad. Yeah. I mean... And that's that's after they did that. So I mean, PlayStation could come out and like, who knows? PlayStation could completely bomb E3. They can come back and say like, um, 
There is no, there will never be backwards compatibility. I know they it. can literally bomb out. And like, who, who's to say in four years from now, they don't fix it. I mean, I do think that as a, as a company, if they make a decision you don't agree with, it is the consumer's responsibility to not take up for that company and to make their, and to make their voice heard because then you get into that comfort cycle of it with a company and they know that so they can get away with doing stuff like that. So that's why I'm pretty vocal about things that I don't like, especially when PlayStation does it is because even though we are a PlayStation podcast and we love PlayStation, I think it's very important that a PlayStation centric uh, medium of any kind needs to hold them accountable for when they do make mistakes. I do agree with that. Uh, I think I know my one though, and it, I, I don't know that it would happen. I, I really doubt it would, but if I, if they came out uh, or if it came out that somehow they had been taking our privacy and selling that information and hid it from us. No. Yeah. Now stuff like that, that like it, that, those are levels where it comes to a point of, I can game elsewhere. If I can, if I can be a, um, look at that outer worlds Xbox yeah. controller. Um, but if I could be like, if, if my credit card information was leaked and it caused any kind of identity fraud or identity theft, um, that's outer wilds. Oh, it sure is. I don't know what that is. I don't either. I think these are indie games, but these are all pretty cool. Xboxes. Yeah, that's, that's um, cool. But, yeah, I think that if, if my identity was ever compromised because of PlayStation or if my credit card was leaked, um, or like what Brett said, is like privacy thing. Like I think at this point, every major like online conglomerate is doing stuff with privacy that we probably don't know about, but if it comes to light is one other thing. It depends on is it hidden behind the scenes or not. You know, that's it. Are they trying it to hide it? depends on how well it was done. Like, oh, we really did not know this happened. Or if there's a record of them saying like, yeah, we knew it happened. We didn't really care to fix it. Yeah, then it just depends, you know. Yeah. Because like, it's not that I have anything to hide. I don't care. Like, yeah, because even when they have it, the, it's you the know, principle of the matter. Go back to the infamous, you know, great PlayStation outage, PSN outage of 2011. Uh, you I'm know. really glad I didn't have a PS3 at that time because I would have been livid. Like, I would have probably sold my PS3 at that point <laughs> because if I had a system that uh, uh, I couldn't get online with that, my, my stuff was potentially stolen off of, I wouldn't have gotten back on it. And that is to say though, well, this is why I give them credit. It wasn't that it was something they knowingly did. They knew it happened and, no, 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 and they went the extra route of going, Hey, we're going to pay. If you want to go do it, we'll pay for identity theft stuff to and go and make sure giving, that this stuff didn't go down. We'll pay for credit card stuff to make sure still they don't a that big hassle to go through. You have to, freeze, oh, of course, like anytime but like they that, did, you have to freeze your credit. You have to do all kinds of stuff like, and it's yeah. just, it's, it's a big hurdle, but that's not to say that. If I left them then, I, it doesn't mean I wouldn't go back to them eventually. Yeah. Like, I, that's which fair, might be something stupid to say. Like, a company leaks my information. I'll go back to them in two years. But yeah. it's all But they didn't really leak their information. It's just they didn't do a good enough job at keeping somebody from it. getting into. Yeah. I mean, and that's... But they also did everything that they could in their power to try and make it right. And that's what they had to do. Right. You know? So, uh, okay. We got some more here. Mr. Josh Shoup asked, if money were not an issue, what is your dream car? A 2018 Hyundai Elantra. <laughs> that I just don't have to pay for. <laughs> yeah. Like, I would probably just pay my car off, honestly. I really don't have a dream car. Um, I don't really care about cars enough to have a dream car. If we're going to go with something newer, and, I mean, just because there's, there's tons of nice cars that I, I would love. I think that the new Teslas are just, the Tesla Roadster that they're talking about doing, oh, dude. Would money be no option? Yeah, that's awesome. Can you imagine the feeling of sitting behind a car that makes essentially no noise and then going from zero to 60 in like 1.2 seconds? It's a little hyperbole, but it's not that far well, off. Well, you heard about that new bill they're proposing, right, where electric cars have to make sounds? So, like, they're putting in st stupid, some companies are doing stupid sounding sounds. To make, like, so, like, well, why, does it, why do they have to make sounds? Probably because of a safety thing. <clears throat> I mean, but realistically, like, why? it sounds so my, dude, my car is super quiet. It's, and you make it road still noise, has to make you sound. Know what I mean? Yeah, like, it still makes some white sound. And that's what these cars have to make too. Well, yeah, but they do even even then they make white. They, they have batteries and moving components and stuff. Right, I but mean, they're still they're fairly quiet quieter. to your engine. Though. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And they, they want to put that into effect because I think Can uh, Canada already has that. That seems like an odd thing. But going back into cars that I actually love, uh, I, I would love, absolutely love a Shelby, a 67 Shelby GT uh, Mustang. 
those are beautiful cars. I really love the old muscle car styles. I think it's one of the most attractive looks that I've seen on a car. They're just very smooth and sexy. Uh, and going back to that, I'd also like a 74 Ranger XLT. Now this was, a, uh, it's technically an F100 Ranger XLT. This was before Ford had the Ranger line as a separate smaller truck. Uh, and it was, you know, part of this thing where they did it as like a, a trimmed version. So the XLT was a top trim. Apparently, this is something that happened in 2016. Electric cars are now required to make noise at low speed so they don't speak, sneak up and kill us. And this is from The Verge, and they say that uh, if it's 19 miles per hour or less in a car that's 10,000 pounds or less, they're required. It says the alert sound is not required at higher speeds because of other factors such as tire and wind noise. Uh, so this is mainly for, uh, it, it's all up to the pin of the automakers to use the sound, whether it's a fake engine noise or a beeping noise. And then some of them are ridiculously sounding. You know what that makes me think of? Uh, uh-huh. The episode of The Office where Andy's sneaking up on Dwight because he put that note on the bushes and Dwight's reading it and he's pulling oh, it behind him. Prius. And yeah. he's like, oh, he's genius. It makes no noise if it's going below five miles an hour. <laughs> so, so apparently that was, that's for the United States. This is for the UK, it looks like. Because it's, well, I say that it's in kilometers and okay. I just don't know. Well, Saul, you literally have no dream cars? No, not really. Like, I mean, I guess like a. Well, I don't know. Like, I, mine, a lot of it has to do with just weird things that tie into. I mean, my dad had one of those F one hundred nine, the seventy four F one hundreds Ranger XLTs. But really, what it comes down to is, once I love the truck because of fond memories and that, I also just think it's a very, it's crazy how aggressive looking of a truck it still looks to this day. Definitely, if you put the right stuff on it, tire wise and whatnot, they're gorgeous. I mean, I, I'm I'm a big fan of people who have made really interesting handcrafted little things and. The older the car and the more you see the way that the things are made, it's kind of interesting, you know, and looking at it, it's like, man, that was a really out there design for a time period when they didn't have the same technology we have. Yeah, and especially, especially since stuff was so stylistically different back and then. technically, I'm going to throw another one in there. I would I would get a DeLorean. DeLoreans are, I hate DeLoreans. Hold on. Dude, DeLoreans are super ahead of their time in terms of design language. Yeah, back in 1985. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but dude, they were, they're still an iconic car. You uh, can't see it and not go... That's cool looking. No, not to me. I, I do not like the way those cars look. I don't like. Anything. Do you know they sell them again? I'm and sure they do. They use sure, the they, thirty or forty thousand. They use the original frames, so the cars oh, are so brand it's a, new. It's a new car with an old, old, old frame style. And it's crazy because what happens is the VIN numbers on the frame. So technically, you're buying a new of a frame that's from the '80s. It's really crazy. That is kind of cool. Uh, but, it's really cool, and they're not. I mean, they're not like forty thousand dollars. They're up there. They're like eighty thousand. dollars I don't like. But that's not bad, and it's for collectible. It's for collectors' purposes. Yeah. And the original DMC. That was a problem. The original DMC had a bunch of problems. They don't. Yeah, know. that's why I don't like them. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, even like, even stuff like the doors wouldn't properly open if you had to yeah. park in such a small clearance. Like you could. Well, yeah, but I mean, there was they had engine problems. They messed up all the time. They were they were the not flux well. Capacitor stopped working. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, you know what I'm talking about. But so. uh, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, if I had enough, if somebody was like, "Here is eighty thousand dollars to buy one car of any of your choice, but you have to buy one car, and here it is today." Probably like, okay. Pay off my car, and then I'd buy a Tesla Model Y or like any Tesla that would fit my budget. Get the Model Three right now. They're they're, they're good 60, looking little cars, 000, and they're yeah, you can get them as low as thirty thousand or I want a brand to forty thousand. I think I want a brand new one from Elon Musk himself. <laughs> That's why the price will hike. Yes. Elon Musk will drive it. Is it to just me. the Model S's that are sixty thousand ish? Yeah, the Model S's are. Dude, they're they're good looking. I cars, mean, technically, though. I would say that would pay if I had. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably do a Model S. Are you a fan of the grillless look? Because you know they don't no, put them there because I they don't need not. them. I am not a fan of the grillless. I think look. it looks slick, the, man. No, dude, the new Model Ys look ugly. I haven't seen the opinion. Model Y, but I'm talking about the Model S, the Roadster, the. Uh, oh Lord, what's the um, the SUV one they have? Oh, the, I, I, I am. I, I I do not know. Hold on, I can. I think it's the Tesla Model X, and it's a it's an SUV, but it looks pretty aggressive, man. And I, I think it's a cool look. I mean, hold on, let me see if I can find one. See, for me, if that just had a space cut out right here, it just looks like a, a weird. Well, the reason nose. I like it is because they have kind of a lip to show where it would be, but you know, I just have a hole there or something. I mean, they, don't, they could put one or there. black. Just could paint it black, even. They could put one there. It's it would literally just be for it visual serve, purposes. Yeah, I was like, it wouldn't serve a purpose. Yeah, it wouldn't serve that's anything. Your, else. That's your trunk, which also may see? be a problem about the, you need. Look at that. No, that that that's, looks good. No. Uh, and look, the reason why white, white is the best color I've seen on that, and that's and that that makes it bearable. And look at that. It's got the old uh, Lamborghini DeLorean yeah, I don't, doors. I don't well. like those doors. Only on the back. I know, but I don't like them. And oh. I only would get them because it would, nobody would sit in my back of my car really. Rarely do they. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, that's cool. That's interesting. Next right. question, Brett. 
Next question. Thank you for that one. That was a fun question. When constructing, this is also Josh. He had a little little quick fire. He says, when constructing the perfect burrito, what ingredients are in it? Sausage, egg, bacon, cheese, jalapenos. A breakfast burrito. uh, I'm with you, though. No. Yeah. I was going to say a sausage, egg, cheese, bacon, jalapenos. I'm going to go red pepper pepper and green peppers and a little bit of onion. Little bit. Real little bit. Um. I mean that that's really good in there and not and have it very evenly lightly throughout it. Yeah. Uh, egg sausage, I'm with you on that. Uh, and make sure it's and, and this is gonna sound crazy. I whenever I made myself breakfast burritos, I tried my hardest to get my sausage to get as close as I could to the McDonald's sausage that they put in there. It's not taste wise, texture wise. It's so interesting how smooth their sausage is. And if you can get that with sausage that tastes a little Probably more reasonable, it's not real sausage. Probably not. But the texture I, I like, so and I've been I, I, I was able to get very close with mine, but it had a more strong sausage flavor. Uh, I like little, that. That's good. Yeah, it was really good. I love that. Uh, I, I'm with you though. Slappy some cheese in there, and cheese differs between what you're trying to do because no, cheese can go so crazy. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Not for burritos. There should only be two cheeses: mozzarella and or cheddar. Cheddar. I was trying to say sharp cheddar, but I said cheddar. But yeah. yeah oh, well, okay. So sharp cheddar or mozzarella. Yeah, depending on the burrito. I mean, I disagree. There's so many other cheeses, but a breakfast not, burrito. Not gonna uh, even then. I what are I you gonna put in a breakfast burrito? Hold on. First of all, Swiss cheese would definitely work in a, in a breakfast burrito. It would complement everything else going into it. And the thing is, because I love about Swiss cheese, I I always call it the complimentary cheese. You just like it because it has holes in it. <laughs> okay, but no, it, it is a great cheese for that. Like, there's some cheeses that don't work in situations. I I, I don't think I'd put Gouda in that. Absolutely not. That's what I'm saying. So there's definitely cheeses that don't work for it, but there are plenty of cheeses that work in that situation, and I just feel like you're crazy. But look, cheese has to be in there some way, somehow. Everybody knows that. Every burrito has to have cheese. Yeah. I I'll mean, give us all this. Sharp cheddar is really good, and it's my preferred especially cheddar. Especially with sausage. Or smoke. Con- I'll do smoke cheddar. Smoke cheddar. No, because you get that from the sausage if you cook your sausage right. You so get the you smoky get, flavor? Yeah, I get you get what the you mean. contrast from the sharp. Yeah. I mean... I, I, Value, I mean, you know, valid on both parts, but I also do like, you know, normal burritos where you start going into, I, I mean, I say I love fajita chicken meat. So you oh, know. See, I hate fajita chicken meat. Oh, I love, I love so brisket. Much. So like brisket, jalapeno. I would actually say do a combo, cheese, you know, do beef, beans. do, do fajita beef. I don't meat, like, com- I don't like combination burritos. Throw me a couple of shrimp in there. Uh, and you know, go back again with the oddly enough the red and green peppers. We gotta stop talking about really this. Good. I am so hungry. I'm hungry too. Okay, let's move on. I am like about to die of hunger. If you could bring back a franchise from pre twenty pre two thousand five at the cost of abolishing a current franchise, which series would you bring back, and which series would you discontinue? Boy, that's some lofty, lofty stuff nah, right there. It's kind of easy for which series I would abolish because you could do any one. You just don't like. Yeah, it's just. At the uh, cost of knowing that, like, let's say it's a series you like, but I don't. Pre-2005? Pre-2005. I've got one. I think I do, too. Legacy of Kane. Yeah. Uh, and specifically the Soul Reaver spinoff. I love those games. Uh, and let's see, what would I discontinue at the start of it? I would do a series that nobody yeah. has really cared for. See, the thing is, getting rid of a series means you get you get rid of its history to an extent, right? What oh, do you see, mean by I- abolish? Does this mean that they won't make any more? Think of any offhand series you don't care for. I'll abolish the Surge and I'll bring back the Chrono series and get a new Chrono Cross game or Chrono, whatever it would be. Chrono Cross Trigger or Trigger Cross. Sure. I don't know. Whatever that would be. Okay. I've got it. Okay. Bye bye, Watch Dogs. There you go. Hello. And technically, this is going to be pre 2005. I don't think it's. I have a little problem with that because Watch Dogs multiplayer is fun. So. Well, technically, there's been a. Look. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna bend the rules just to give an example of a game I love. I want whatever it takes. I want something to happen in the same vein of 2008 Prince of Persia. I will die on this hill. So many people hate that game. Oh, I know. And I'll and I'll give them the one thing. The one reason I'll agree with them that's BS is that the real ending is behind DLC. Yeah. Outside of that, that game is phenomenal. I love it so much, and it's a perfect example of a game that had really amazing art direction at a time when games were not known for that. You know. Love it. And of course, doesn't hurt that Nolan North was the prince's voice. So he was good the only question. voiced actor in that game, wasn't he? Or the no. voice character? No. Was he not? Okay. No, the girl was too. Uh let's see. Josh Shoop says, Do you guys have deep nostalgia for older consoles such as Atari up to the Super Nintendo Sega? Uh Sega is about where mine start. I don't have anything else. The Sega Genesis 16 bit is uh, where I started gaming, like I've talked about before. I have 
I'm not going to say deep nostalgia. Deep nostalgia hits in PS1 for me. Um, and even a little bit of Sega Saturn, oddly enough. And But Dreamcast, PS1, those are where like my deep nostalgia hits. Um, outside of that, though, I have a ton of weird games that I just remember super well from the Sega Genesis because I guess it's like that gaming root thing. Chuck Rock 2, Son of Chuck. Never played Chuck Rock 1. I played Columns, which is essentially like a Bejeweled before Bejeweled existed on yeah. the Sega. Love that. Uh, I played Booger Man, my first game ever, and I love that game. Um, and, and even though I do prefer the 3D Sonic games when they're at their best, the 2D Sonic games have a huge part in my heart. And specifically, this isn't even technically a traditional Sonic. Sonic Spinball is a super fun game. I love that game so much. Uh, and also Sonic and Knuckles shout out because I still love to this day the idea of being able to hook a different Sonic game into it to play levels off of the other game. That was yeah. with Sonic and Knuckles as the characters. It was like, to this day, it's really a crazy idea to think about doing that from a hardware perspective and not from a software. Software, where, yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I'm going to say Super Nintendo since that was the very first system I technically started on, and I have a lot of good memories there with the Addams Family, Link to the Past, Jurassic Park, a lot of good old games like that. So, Super Nintendo. Good one. Let's see, what are your guys' thoughts on people using cheat devices? To my best knowledge, at this point, there's no way of cheating on the Xbox One or Nintendo Switch unless you have modded the system, but with PlayStation, there is a save wizard. I don't know enough about this. I did not know that there was an active way to cheat on the PS4. I know the PS3 had some, and so did the Xbox, uh, where people would cheat on Red Dead Online and whatnot. Uh, so, But going into current-gen system like you, like you are, I'm not... I mean... My thoughts on it is, of course, in a perfect world, in any kind of competitive game, there's no, there should be no reason to cheat because it... Here's the thing about cheating. Cheating's fun for a very short period. Every now and then when I'm playing something with like my daughter or something, I'll cheat just to be ridiculous and kind of mess with her and have fun. And then I'll go back to playing normal. And of course, I'm better at her a lot of things anyway. But cheating has this short-lived fun that could just be like, oh, I'm screwing around. This is fun to do. But in the long run, it doesn't hold up. And it's one of those things where it loses the point of the game where you actually feel like you're doing something. Yeah, and I, I pretty much, uh, I'm one for like, if you're doing it a single player game, that's all right. But if you're doing a multiplayer game, you're trash. Oh, yeah, agreed. I think cheat codes in those games was fine. Yeah. So, do we have any more on Facebook? Let's see. Yeah, we definitely have more. Well, I was going to say, some of those, like those quick farms we got to bank because we're already at like almost nine. We haven't got to Twitter yet. Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost done. This is the last one. Or we have to use the quickfire questions like quickfire. We'll do it. Look, we got this right here. Scribe, describe the moment that you knew that video games went from being a passing phase to a lifelong love. What game were you playing? Was it with friends? My, I've talked about this before. Uh, the moment that I knew that I loved video games and I was like, I'm never going to be able to put these down was realistically... Kingdom Hearts 1 uh, and it just kind of started my lifelong love letter with them but the earliest example of a game that gave me the feeling and I just you know you're still a little too young was Crash Bandicoot 1 uh, on the PS1 honestly mine is going to go back to A Link to the Past because being one of the first games that I beat and then it's one of those weird things that like even though I had other systems at the time I still preferred to play that over something like Golden or not Golden uh, 007 Nightfire on PS2 without got a launch um it's one of those weird things that like I always would go back to, and I still will to this day. So okay. yeah, leave to the past. Excluding now, if you, and this is all still Josh, excluding now, if you could live in any time in history, when would it be and why? This is a rough question. I don't, I don't have an answer for that because I don't like. I love history. I don't like any other timeline that I would want to live in. There, like. What I mean by that is is that I would never want to live in any other timeline than what I currently live in. Well, you know why? Because you're logically enough to go. You know how many amenities that we have now? Like, if I go back to that timeline, the chances of me dying of some random disease, they don't even know what it is. Oh, yeah, dude. Like, are just, it's not only that, though. It's just like, roof. it's one of those things that everybody is, you know, people <clears throat> people go back and say, like, if I had to pick one, it would be the 80s. Odd. I mean, that's the closest to when I was born. I mean, I guess, but, I, I mean, I guess, why would you want to go to something that's so close to something that because you Because I grew up. I grew up in the early 90s, so like that, there's still culture and and ways of life and stuff that I'm familiar with. So you, because I don't want to go so far back that I'm not familiar with it, because I don't care. Like I don't care enough about that time period okay. to want to adapt to myself to live that way. I'm too okay. la I'm too lazy for that. 
late, and this is this this is another one of those weird reasons as to why I really love uh, the order. I really like late 18th century and even early or late 1800s but and even early 1900s. There. Hold on. I, I get your point. I, and honestly, I agree that I don't know that I could be, but that's because of my brain being too much like the, oh man, all the bad stuff that could happen. I do love those things enough to think like it would be very interesting to be able to observe what that was truly like right now. As crazy as it's going to sound, can you imagine what it would have been like to be in the time period and actually live through it and everything. And uh, let's, say, let's say it this way. Let's say it didn't have to be permanent. Let's say that you could go, uh, even if it was two weeks, you can go to two weeks, go to the time period when like the bubonic plague was hitting really hard and see what was going on in that situation and kind of how people were reacting. And then catch the bubonic plague again and die. Hold on. Knowing that, that's what I mean. The, knowing that I won't it, catch in, it? In my, in my brain, it'd be like the knowing that I wouldn't catch it. Being able to observe that point in history is crazy. Being able to see how people deal with the panic and mass history of knowing they're going to die. Or was it even that bad at that point because death was already so common from other diseases? You know, we're in a time period right now where we're, death is so scary to us, I think, because death has not been common in the last 70 years. Not in the same way that it was. I mean, once we started figuring out these things, once people stopped having to bury one of their kids, which was pretty much a common thing prior to the 50s, you would. it was very likely that at one point in your life, and maybe you can go a little further back, maybe like the 30s, but it was still, that was when the depression hit. So it was still likely that if you had a kid, one of your kids, definitely if you had multiple, if you had three to five kids, you were going to bury one of your kids most likely. Uh, and it was just a crazy thing. So I don't know if anybody ever really had the same fear that we do. I think we think back about the bubonic plague and it's like terrifying, but I don't know if it was as terrifying for them because death was already all around them and that was just up in the scale a lot. But we're in the safest time in history right now, even with mass shootings and stuff going on. See, my whole thing though is, is that history has done such a good job of documenting that kind of stuff that I don't need to be there in person. I disagree entirely. History, the biggest problem about history is that history is all written from weird recounts of it. It's always done way too shallowly. It's really, you have to do a lot of study to actually have a real understanding of what was going on at that time. The, the problem and though, I, part of that put, I put on the fact of how they teach history. They teach history in this very shortened and condensed version. One of my favorite things that someone said recently that I find very interesting, uh, it was Tim Poole when he was talking about uh, the Civil War, and he's talking about, you know, saying, like, you know, do we think, do you think that we're in another Civil War? History is so interesting because it's trying to condense years into a very... Did he just say, does he think we're in another Civil War right now? No, somebody was asking him, like, do, when do we think that we're going to be on the verge of another... Do, oh, okay. do you think that we're on the verge of another Civil War? And he goes, we could be in it right now and not even know, because the thing about the Civil War, when it was first going on, he goes, people back then, because it was such a long expanse of time, he goes, they didn't even... Qu sometimes they were fighting and didn't even realize that they were in what was going to be known as a Civil War. I mean, well, yeah, because it's not technically declared. It's just like that's yeah. the Civil War at the time of happening. Exactly. That's History is more about the way that people perceive it after the events have happened. Right. Seeing it in the moment is so much different. And the way that you would actually, and that's what but, I'm saying. But you wouldn't be able I to do anything I have such a shallow, like no, it, it would just be being able to witness it. Just to witness it would be enough for me because See, the problem, I think it's interesting. The problem not with, even from a greater understanding thing. I, I guess that's part of it, but it's just that. A history is so shallow that you can feel like you're an expert on something and have read every piece of history that you can and actually be more knowledgeable than the average person on something. But going back there and seeing it, you're still going to, it's going to be well, so Well, of course different. that's going to happen, but there's still enough, there's still enough information and educational to pieces give you an out. Idea. It's not even an idea. It's just the way it was. Like for the most part, you can't say an idea when, I mean, I don't know. So man. much of it was documented. Like people know, people understand the way the bubonic play was. They understood how they lived their lives. They understood the day of the day stuff they did. Like, what more do you really need other than what would come it, from that experiencing first Experiencing it and actually but having no the way emotions. to have that information. Oh, well, yeah, th but this is talking about being able to go back. Right, to but I'm period. just saying you're comparing. You're saying that it's not technically complete. I'm not saying that. I'm not even faulting history. It's it's the way that we as humans have to do it. We've always done it, even with oral tradition. It's the way we are. We have to find ways to shorten long things, and by doing that, you miss out on a big bulk of what it is, and really being able to truly try and give the closest thing we have right now to trying to have somebody experience something is still a bastardized version like red dead redemption 2 is a pretty good example of the closest approximation we can really try and do of what it might might be like to live in the like 1905 or 1902 or even the late 1800s in the western world because again we don't know it the best we can do is try and get in a game that lets us see these things what about the books that have been written about this 
the he, movies that have been written, made, made about this stuff. Well, that's like, what why, I mean. Why, why is Red Dead the definitive? The, the reason I say Red Dead, and this is just an example, what, I mean, what I'm getting at is gaming is an example of something, and definitely when you get into VR, VR is going to get you closer than ever to be able to essentially be like putting yourself in the situation to where you can visually witness it in a way that is essentially you're the main character you're wrapped around it. it's like you're experiencing it as yourself red dead does a good job for me personally because i played in first person so while arthur was there and existed yeah it's there but the rest of the world was like me going through and being like this is me seeing how this world is and how people react in those moments and that's rare because normally i actually do play games as the character but games in first person do allow you those moments of, of time in between where you can kind of be like no this is me like my time petting that horse in that game was me and that's why it was that much, you know, I mean, when you lose a horse in that game, it's like really sad for me because I was like, oh, man, what's going on here? I love that horse. But it goes back to what I'm talking about. It's games are the closest thing that can put you in the in the front seat of you're experiencing it as it happens around you and being able to look left, right, forward, backwards. Movies are condensed. They're a camera that you can't see. The time limits are too short. Even if you want to make a 25 hour movie, you're still doing it from a camera that's set in weird perspective. That still sounds way too pretentious to me, though. Like. I mean, people I'm not, have submersed, them, submersed themselves in history in the past to a great degree. It's like, well, why, why pretentious? I mean, that that's a pretty interesting word because you're you're saying that it's better to it's you're saying essentially it's it's a better experience of history through a video game than it could be from a book or a movie. Closest that we can get to you experiencing it as the history be, would be. Wouldn't wouldn't that be equal to better? I mean, if you want to, you if you better, want to objectify it as better, yeah. It is, but it depends on what you're aiming at history for. And I think the interesting parts of history is being able to put yourself in the shoes of the people that are doing it. And it's really hard to do that the, with any other medium. The problem with the games, though, is that th there's something they will never be able to do, and that is cover the entirety of a subject of a time era. Yeah, that's true. And that is something that books, text, movies, poetry, anything from the time era, you can collect and read upon that over will give you time. Insight. I mean, I guess. I mean, well, what well, I mean that there's never going to be one book that does an ex a, 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 a books, expand. Yeah. Like okay, so multiple games, books, multiple games. Right, but what you one, run into the same thing. Is is what I'm getting you, at. You, our lives keep flickering back there. Um, but why does our? Well, well, the thing is though, is that like you're equating you're equivalenting Red Dead to being probably one of the best Wild Wild West style games that will teach you or that can show you and make you feel the closest to that part of history. And in the America. reason I say Red Dead Two is specifically because of some of the I don't agree with all the decisions they made from a gameplay perspective, but using it as a historical walkthrough. And I'll give shout outs to uh, Assassin's Creed as well when they did their tour mode where you can play them as if you're going to walk through the areas and learn about them and be able to walk around and be like, you, you know. When I say games are the closest, games are the closest way you can do it in a way that's supposed to be historical looking at it if you didn't just go there. Like, you know, when you're looking at, or sometimes in things that don't exist. You well, know, there's plenty of stuff uh, but, like Google Maps and stuff that also let you do that. Sure, yeah, but some things don't exist, but we can try and recreate what we well, have. Well, yeah, a, a, that could be redone a reference. 3D technology. Exactly. And, so, you know, there may be pyramids that don't exist anymore that we have references and text that we can try and rebuild it, and you can go, and like, this is what being in this temple would have yeah, been. Yeah, I, I This is the closest approximation I can get. I just don't think that Red Dead is the epitome oh, of the, the reason Wild, I Wild used, West. The reason I used Red Dead is because the game is content with letting you just live life in a way that Red Dead 1 and other other games and that's just an example for one time period I'm not right it's not both but Red Dead is a great example of a game that took a lot of design decisions to go through and say okay well we're gonna let you literally hunt we're gonna let you go to stores talk to people get drunk hang out with people you can play that whole game with literally no violence if you don't want it and you can just literally walk through a world that is built up to be a very close approximation of what they imagine. And it's an, it's a made up environment, but it's a close approximation of what a wild West time would have been like, both in architecture design, the way people act, the kind of violence that right. happened in terms of and now, you're right. Books and all can do that. And I'm not trying to take away from the fact that books can do that. I mean, literature can do a whole lot and it can be very moving, but it's still limited in the fact that, it's telling you a very specific thing right here. Games do have the ability to let me have experiences. The, the problem with them. that though is, is that it, games are dead end. Now, why do you say that? I mean, what do you mean by dead end? I guess. Well, I because say. you you just said that over the course of all the all the potential multiple games would mm -hmm. span that time era, made by multiple developers who are often well, why different directive styles. Well, but books could be potentially from different things. But look, this is what I'm not saying. history books though. 
Okay. History books are typically from pretty a, pretty clean slate when it comes to this kind of stuff. Okay, well, look, that, this is what I would say then. To you, I, I get where you're going, but the same developer could do ex- so. History books is all. But who's going to do a Wild Wild West game though? They're not going to. That's the thing. Is that? Oh no, maybe not. But that we're not talking about would they? This is just if there was a Wild Wild West series of games versus had, a Wild Wild West, you know, wild, encyclopedia. But anyway, yeah, uh, looking at the old West, if there's a game that did it in the same way of the encyclopedia. It would be way more of an undertaking, but you would technically be getting a more full experience of what it is because me and you could be, this is the thing about books. The only difference in the way that books can be done is that you can perceive the information being given you in the book differently. Well, but, depending on the content of the book as well. But you're all still reading the same words in the same pages. The effect it has on you can be different. Well, it actually could be up to your imagination too. Yeah, so, that's something. Worse effect, imagination. Exactly. Yeah. The effect that it can have on you can differ. The difference between games is I can literally roll through that game, and because of the freedom that a game like Red Dead with it, and it's just again the example I use because it made a lot of decisions to do this. Me and you can play Red Dead, and I could literally tell you an entire story of something I witnessed and saw and everything that you just didn't. And that's the closest well, thing to the, the, living in that time that's period. That's a flaw, though, right? No, because because if, if you're wanting to learn the history, though, if and, there's if there's missable parts, yeah, it, and there's two things. It's it's just what is history? Is history a certain set of information that you're always supposed to carry forward, or is history just what it was like in that time? And I think it's a mixture. I think it's I, I think facts, it is too. I think it's facts and records and, and the way that they lived their life and how things were accomplished and how things that sure. were set forward in their life. Sure, and I, I would agree with that. It's a mixture of two. That's why I say it's, since it's not clean cut, Red Dead has real things. Like Pinkerton's is a real agency, so right. much so that they were getting they sued, were sued yeah. for it. Uh, but they did a lot to try and make that game uh, open in a way that's free. And then we'll, we'll run through the next. Okay, we had spent way longer on this than I anticipated. Way which is longer. Interesting. Because it's a shoot, it's a misfire question or a quick fire question. Yeah, well, yeah, but it you ain't doesn't by Josh's matter. Rules. It leads to these. He didn't say it would be quick fire. It's just oh, I, assume, I assume whenever he gives us that many questions, they're all quick fire. Or they're all like backlog questions, which is what we're supposed to put back for a rainy day. These are my favorite questions when they happen like this, though, because I feel like it's this is weirdly productive conversation just so we can understand each other's viewpoints in a weird way. Because this is one of those things. This question, I don't know if we would have ever, ever ended up on this throughout natural friendship. Josh, if uh, if there's ever an episode in which there's low content, there's episodes only 30 minutes long. And just because it's know that Brett took the time to take all your backlog questions and answer them in one episode. Look. So I apologize if I come off as trying to rush through them. I Fine. know typically Look, though we're gonna move through. I like the rest to keep of this. these questions. You just came home from a big lo- from a long day of work. The kids are gone for the weekend with grandparents, and the wife is doing stuff with her friends. I don't have kids or grandparents. Yeah, I do. You, I don't anymore, actually. You have an entire evening to yourself with no prior commitments. What is the ultimate rela- relaxation that you would have? Bubble bath, thirty minute hot shower, coffee, what? Sleep. Mm. Sleep with nobody bothering me. Uh, <laughs> that sounds crazy, but it's true. Probably play a game with a headset on. Yeah, that goes to show you how crazily different me and Saul's lives are. And I think Josh kind of understands what I'm saying. Like, when you have kids and a lot of different things that kind of happen and are going on constantly, it's like the pacing of life changes so much that when you get it off and it's like it's just you, there's something so nice about either sleeping with no one bothering you, which is a very odd and very rare occurrence, or sitting in silence because it just you don't ever get it. Right. It sounds weird. There's been a couple times since I've gotten that chair where I just sat in the chair and it was like, everybody else is asleep. I'm by myself. And I'm like, I just want to soak in nothingness. Yeah. For us. I get like, for, it gets... even if it's 10 minutes, I need 10 minutes of, it's essentially like a form of meditation. Yeah. You know? So, all right, let's see uh, two more, I think, and then we're done. Have you guys ever considered doing a specific question of the week, something you could post on Facebook and Twitter, and that would be the community involvement in the show? Uh, we could also do – we could add that into the community state. You know, that, that could either evolve into that. I, I like the idea. I mean, I, it's not something we've considered I would in honestly this sense. rather do the question instead of community state. Well, I mean, there could still be the community's take on the question. We just right. determine what the question, be the question is. is though. Yeah, because um, I like the community's take and all, but I also feel like because I, I rarely listen to all the podcasts, I want to hear people's response on this and pay, maybe their opinions. But the community's take section is very out of place for what we normally do. It's good just because it's new. I'm I, not a fan of. Yeah, it. Yeah, I was about to say it is it's new. Very and bouncy. Since you actually listen yeah, to them. it's as somebody who listens every every week technically to us. I'm just listening for audio and 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 just making timestamps. 
it's very weird of a it's very weird of a segment that's disjointed almost, which is why I felt like timestamps for those people are going to be really maybe important. maybe because of where it's placed that that may be a thing. It's not we'll have to just not, look and see. Not to me because I like where it's placed. I just liked maybe if we just did one person's take because they, what happens is the opinion bouncing. Well, and last episode and I did topic the weird bouncing. Way. Yeah, yeah because I was doing both. Right, I'm with so, you. That, that's not a bad idea. We'll take maybe one, and if there's really a second one that's really strong, two. Yeah. And That's not a bad idea. Everybody has a chance of getting weekly. Let us know. Like this is kind of the more casual kind of podcast. So let us know uh, if yeah. you thought about how you think about that. I do also know a lot of people are going to skip over those because they just don't know the people in the community. So like they don't necessarily care to listen about what the community thought. Maybe but I think that, Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, then there's the people who do know those people, and then there's even people who don't, but they're curious about other listeners' feedback. Yeah. What I would say is it's more about sometimes the great thing is that it challenges us to think about things that we either missed and didn't think about, or it challenges us to clarify as to why we think that we're still holding our position. Right. It's, I think it's an interesting point for that, but last episode, it did feel weird even when doing it. And I was like, I don't, if I could go back and do it, I don't think I would do one as a response. And then one as the answer to what we did. We're going to find a way to find tweak that. It's just yeah, still new. It's still a working process. Yeah. We just want to make sure we have a section of the show that feels like it's uh, community involvement. And it, cause it, it, it adds a layer to the show that when it wasn't there, the show came out, it seemed a little robotic in a yeah. weird way. Um, I still enjoyed doing it. It was just a little bit different. All right. Last one. This one comes from Josh Ayers says is doing the state of play a good idea. Have updates every month or two, or do you prefer conferences? Oh, conferences. I, I think it misspelled. Uh, do you prefer conferences every six months or a mixture of both? I mean, it's going to be a mixture of both. Uh, maybe not this year with no E3. But... I think, yeah, I think they've, they've pretty much even said in the state of play that this year, they're really going to lean on state of play. Yeah. And I'm fine with either or like, I like the uh, conferences. Um, I'm going to get into a question here a little bit about it, or I might as well go ahead and get into it now real quick. Um, let me see. We have a couple that are direct or that are, uh, related to the direct, um, or the state of play, whatever you want to call it. State of play. Yeah. I'm just going to call them direct because that's for, it's, for it's a lack stuck of in a, my head. Yeah. And that's essentially what they're being. I and mean, they're getting information directly to you. Um, what PlayStation doing their own directs, what would be the ideal length and exposure of future you guys like to see in, and exposure to the future? Would you guys like to see in each direct? How often would you like to see these put out? So I'd, I'd often like them to be 30 minutes long at the most. Uh, and then I'll often once every three months, two months, somewhere in that time frame. Yeah, I think I get what he's saying when he said like exposure to the future. Uh, I want to say like, I think he's meaning that as, do you want the games they show to be, how far out would you like them to be? I think Within a year. I'd say even less than that. Within six well, months. I'm being gracious. Within six months would, would be really smart because it would make the directs feel so much more purposeful. As to say, like, well, the reason we did it now is because these are all things that are going to be releasing within these next six months. And then when we do the next one, maybe three months later. And I don't know how often. I, I think once a quarter would seem like a good fix to me. You know what I mean? I, I don't I don't know that it needs to be more often than no, that. Well, it just depends on what they have to release. Well, once a quarter minimum. And then... No, no, no. I'd say more well, frequent than once a quarter. But it just depends on what they have to release if it's going to be worth it. Yeah, so not even no, don't force one a quarter if there's not going to be anything of right. value. But then Fair. if you have stuff of value that you need to do one or two within a quarter, then do them. But here's the thing: the stuff of value is a very interesting thing. We've already talked about like well, I thought the, subjective. the state of play was interesting. I didn't watch it, uh, and it it wasn't. I mean, it, I guess what's weird to me is that there's a lot of people that expected E three level drops, but just at a lower quantity. And I'm like, but if they had anything that was going to be worth to their experience that they thought was going to be worthy of being on E3's stage, they would have just done E3. They yeah. wouldn't sneak it in this video. The reason that they said they're not doing E3 is that the stuff they have to show, even though it's interesting, is not going to be necessarily aimed at everybody. And they try and keep E3 big, bigger games that are aimed towards a larger group of the, of the thing. And then a couple of niche spots just to still show it. But E3 is far more geared at the bigger groups of fans. Something like this, even if they, let's just say they did it once a month. I don't want, I don't want them to, but with as many games as comes out on their console, they could spend, you know, once a month or once every two months showing some of these games with low expectations of what you're getting into. It's just to highlight information and stuff that's coming and not expect big things out of it. So I like the idea. And I would think in a year, like when they get into the PS five and the actually have announcements to start doing this mix is going to be smart. Yeah. Um, and then the other reason I would say that is depending on what they're doing, it would be smarter for them to use these, uh, these 
state of play things to give dates to things. Uh, reveal them at E3 in all their glory, and then whenever it comes time to actually slap a date on it, just do it in a, in a direct. Don't, you know, that way you avoid what you always talk about, Saul, which is showing the same thing, even over if it's just as quickly as to show a date. Yeah. You, if you can completely keep from showing it again at all, better. Yeah. And if then, you can do it in a state of play, because I wouldn't mind if I saw something twice in a state of play. The expectations are different. Yeah. I just didn't watch it because I saw that it was heavily VR, and I was just like, well, I don't have a VR. So I just yeah. looked at the titles. I'm like, okay, cool. About half. Yeah. And it, no, not, not like, there's only three games that wasn't VR. I mean, but the rest, well, Those that, are like non games. The reason least. I say half is because some of the games just had VR modes. You know what I mean? Oh. So that I makes say sense. half, like, they weren't necessarily like VR exclusive. It was kind of just like. The, I thought they were all VR exclusive except for like. No. What was it? The uh, No Man's Sky getting VR is well, awesome. That's a VR. Um, that's but a VR there was another one that had a VR mode. Uh, it was the genie one. I, oh yeah, concrete genie. Yeah, uh, but, but there was there was more. Than but I'm talking in terms of like Iron Man, No Man's Sky, like those two. Even if they don't have VR modes, it's still like yeah. They, Blood and Truth was another VR one that is VR exclusive that they that they talked about, yeah. which it wasn't a reveal. So there's three but, out yeah. of the six. So like that's I was just saying that there's there's. Not it wasn't enough for me to take the time out of my day yesterday to. Well, watch they showed it. more than six games. Also, well, that's what I was saying. So, I was saying at least you said half, half was normal games. I yeah. was like, well, yeah, it seems like there's more. But then Blake, just to get into this one real quick, he says since the episode will air after the reveal, what are your thoughts on the Google console and will you possibly pick it up? I think he got that question answered with this last episode. We were talking about it in yeah. Discord earlier today. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Blake, for the question. I'm interested in trying it out. That's where I'll leave it. And yeah. I'm, I, I bought PS Now for a year. It was on sale for $60. I'm going to see how much PS Now has improved, and that will lead me to whether I'm more cautious about Stadia or a little more forgiving and thinking that they might actually nail it. I'm going to see how if, if PS Now, which has been around for five years, has improved to a point where it's pretty usable, then Google might really be able to make it something that's even better. Yeah, you'll have to let me know. Yeah. Uh, Matt Green says, what game have you thought? No, nah, that's not for me, but then tried it and loved it. Just started playing Beyond Two Souls, and I love this story. Uh, Neo. I don't like Feudal Japan stuff, or at least I oh, thought yeah. I didn't, due to uh, Samurai Warriors back on PS2. I hated those games, and turns out it was just a game series that I hated, and not the time era. So, Neo. Also, shout out to Sekiro, because now I love that era a lot, and now I'm enjoying Sekiro a lot. Earliest examples of this, because I'm pretty wide open these days, if, I, if something looks even moderately like it may be interesting, then I'll give it a try. Even if the rest of it looks like, I, none of it looks like it fits for me, but there's one thing, whatever, if I can find one thing that'll let me kind of attach to it, I'm more willing to try it if I have time. Uh, but earlier examples of that are like puzzle games. Uh, I never thought that I would care for puzzle games in... I guess I should have thought about the fact that like me liking Columns, Columns is essentially a puzzle game to an extent. Yeah. But going more towards like traditional puzzle games, I wouldn't have thought that I'd really like them. But, you know, Portal proved me wrong and partially because of cool subject matter. Portal 2 was amazing. Then you have games like the Talos Principle, um, which I didn't, I, everything else about it seemed weird. But that little weird robot thing and the idea of like, well, you're playing as a robot. What are they going to do from a story perspective? That one thing that allowed me to catch on to it and then play it and I ended up loving it. And it's just... It's one of those things. Those are the games that have forced me to get to a point where I'm like, this is why you got to be more open. This is why you can't think that you're going to hate anything. Right. You just got to, if you have time to try something that you think it might be even remotely interesting, then you could, you should, if you have the means to do so. so. Just paraphrase my Dark Souls article just about, uh, Sean Satteru says, what are your favorite loading screens in games? No, th dude, this is such a good question. I'm, you know, even when I was listening to a bunch of gaming podcasts when I used to, when I ever had time to, uh, I've never heard anybody ask this question, but this is a great question. Uh, ones that I go to all the time, uh, all of the Dragon Ball Z Budokai games, all of them. Yeah, because they had those mini games built into them. You know, the one where the, the Cyberman would pop up and you, yeah, you had to spam yeah, buttons and stuff. Yeah, to and get you'd them. hit them down. There was the ones where it was, uh, you'd, you'd hit a button and it would throw out different capsules and you'd see what came yeah. out. Uh, I mean, those are great ones. I think that there's other loading screens that do things where it's like interactive. I think. I don't care for those, though, that much. Like, Budokai was like the only ones I actually cared for. Well, back in the day, it was like the idea of it was how new. can you make a load screen not be so abrasive? Right. And because it, it was boring in most games and they were often lengthy. So mm -hmm. this is what kind of helped them out. So if you do a game like Dragon Ball Z Budokai, you never end up setting the controller down because you have a reason. You have something to keep your attention and keep your hand on the controller. So when you come back in, 
any game, it's kind of that thing, like, you know, when they talk about marketing, it's all about keeping the game in the person's hand. It's like, that's what they aim for in anything, any kind of media. It's like, we want to keep the, the attention of the, of the listener. We want to keep the focus on us. So whatever we can do to keep them focused in this, in these interstitial time periods is best because everything has to have lulls. But if you can do something in the law, like a loading screen would be a lull in this sense. If you can do something to try and at least keep me moderately attached, then when you swell back up, I'm right there and ready to go. And I have a better, more fond memory of it. Yeah. Which um, Honestly, I guess the answer for mine would be Bloodborne because they, when they first launched, there was the three minute loading debacle that had uh, that the game had, and then they were a black loading screen with a flashing Bloodborne logo in the middle, and it yep. was big and it was useless. They finally added in lore screens, which was really really cool, and kind of a saving grace for my second playthrough. I got to go back after a while the game had, or after the game had been out for a while, and I was like, okay, I now I'm getting I'm seeing item descriptions for things I had and I didn't really go in and look at. And it lets you get to the lore. It's a really good use of that actually, because the thing about the Dark Souls game and even Bloodborne is that a lot of the lore is hidden in item descriptions. Yeah. So being able to see them, it what it does is for the people who didn't realize that seeing that load screen with there, they'd be like, oh man, I didn't get enough time to read it because they actually shorten the load screens by a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but they are short. They are short. I'd say about half. Now that's still a minute and a half of loading, but that's way better than what was yeah, there. Yeah, I'd say that's about on par. Um, but you know, when you think about it in that situation, it may draw somebody into going into and actually looking at the item description and then realizing there's a ton of story that's in the back end. You know, so for people who are interested in that thing, it's a gateway to that. Uh, my other one, and I don't have like a great example of a game in my mind, but I know I've seen it in games. I like it when games, t- definitely open world games, where they view what you do and not necessarily where you're at in the game. And when the world changes based off of your actions, the load screens change to reflect the way the world is now versus I need what an it example is. Example for that. I'm trying to think of a good game where it's like, you know. I, I don't know if it was like this in Vampire, but as a as an example to give you the idea of what I'm talking about is like in Vampire I talked about if you let too many people get sick and you didn't because you're a doctor, you know, if you didn't heal them, then cities would go down, and as they went down in stages, you'd see them become more and more dilapidated. And there's been other games that do that to like it affects the world or characters or something, and then in the loading screens they'll show you that these characters or these worlds are slowly decaying, and then if you start doing better stuff, you start seeing the load screens improve again. And it's like just static images of the world are like a little roll, but they'll change small. things. Things. I can't think of a game right off the top of my head, but I know I've seen it and I just, I'm, I'm blanking, but I like mm. that idea because again, it makes me want to pay attention to the loading screen. Be like, Oh, I've been doing good. The loading screen looks better. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. You want to nail down the rest? What do you have? Uh, we do have Jason Gonzalez and he says, has there ever been a moment in your life when you just stopped playing and didn't play anything for months? If so, what got you back into gaming? Demon souls did. I was really, really, I've told it before on the podcast, but I was really, really bored of um, pretty much Xbox 360 gaming. And then after that 2013 E3, I pretty much was like, okay, I'm going to try out PS3 now. Um, since I had an experience with PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. And Demon Souls kind of started my addiction. And then Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2. Uh, and then Dark Souls 3, then Bloodborne and all that stuff. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say Xbox slipping up is the one that caused me to find out not only. Um, was something that got me back into gaming, but something that actually found my favorite series of almost all of my gaming career. Hmm. Brett? When I, I was a poor, young, broke man before I started hanging out with Devin again and I moved into town uh, with my PS2 and just had somebody I could actually borrow games off of. I couldn't afford games for a long period. My parents were divorced and mom lost her good job that she had for a little bit. Uh, that gave us a little bit of nice amenities and like the occasional game. Uh, so I had about a year period where I just couldn't play stuff because I didn't have anything. And you kind of get tired of playing the same thing that you have. And I didn't have much anyway. Yeah, you get that so fatigue. So it's like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. And we moved in and I remember I went to Devin's house and he had a 360 and he was playing Criminal uh, or Condemned Criminal Origins or whatever, the first Condemned game on the 360. Um, and... He's just kind of watching him play it and then like realizing he had a PS2 and then he let me borrow some of his PS2 games. And ironically enough, uh, this was God of War. The first God of War uh, was the first game I ever borrowed from him. And it was the first game I had played in almost a year. And I mean, it was one of those like immediate sparks of like, this is what I've been missing out on. Like, hmm. this is what I love about gaming. And that was really cool. And then immediately from there, I started borrowing stuff from him and uh, doing work on the side where I could to get money to buy my own games. And it was kind of like a rebirth into gaming. And that's, I think it's also partially why I've really always cared for God of War. It's like a, it's tied to a bringing me back to gaming yeah, kind of thing. I can see that with the Soul Series. Yep. Blake says, what is your least favorite part of some of your favorite games? Hollow... 
Not Hollow. What is it called? Wow. I just blanked. What game? Uh, Dark Souls. Blight Town. Blight Town. There's oh. Blight Town and Dark Souls, and then there's the... Um, mm. It's in Dark Souls 2, and it's it's this, it's almost... It's, it might as well be Blight Town. I can't think what that's called. And then there's the the poisonous um, Swamp. road of sacrifices in um, uh, Dark Souls three. Actually, that part's not called, called road of sacrifices. That is um, not road of sacrifices. It, it's the one with the poisonous swamp in it, though. Yeah, I don't remember the name of the areas as well as you do, but I know what area Fair you're talking keep. about. Fair and keep. That's right. Yeah. So, which those... is funny because isn't the boss fight for that area your favorite boss fight? Yep. <laughs> so you hate the area, but you love the boss. Yeah, uh, the gutter in Dark Souls 2. That level is like Blight Town, except worse, and it is terrible. Those are good examples. Um, so favorite parts, or worst parts of your favorite games. Well, that's a hard one, because typically a game doesn't hit my favorite bar without it. But I mean, we could. there's definitely things that exist. I mean, uh, Kratos looking like a puppeteer in God of War 1. That. He literally looked like a puppet. You could like see all of his joints, and like they look like you know how puppet joints always look like they're painted in. Yeah, it's exactly what it looked like, and I hated it. Uh, man, I, that's a good question. That's I, I am severely blanking on anything else that really comes to mind. I mean, oh, I got one. Far Cry Three. I love Far Cry Three. The ending of that game, and now not the entirety of the ending. But without going too far, you have Voss, this amazing, amazing... You know what? At this point, Far Cry 3 is pretty old. I'm going to spoil this. It's not that crazy. Don't spoil because I still haven't beat it yet. I, there might be a chance I go back. You didn't beat Far Cry 3? No. Remember that game gave me motion sickness on CES TV and uh, on PS3, and I just didn't want to play it. Wow. Okay. Well, I can't say it then, but the ending that they chose to go with in Far Cry 3 in terms of like the last fifth of the game... Versus the previous bit, it's like you have a masterpiece of a game here, and then you do something that just ruins the interest of the game until the very end. The very end pulls it back up, thankfully. Oh. Uh, but that's a good example. I know Blake loves Far Cry, so at least Blake will know what I'm talking about. And since it was his question, there we go. So, Matt Green says again, he says, more seriously, see a No Man's Sky uh, is releasing big updates. Are they forgiven for the poor game at release? And then he goes on to say, I still enjoyed it, though I platinumed it when it was harder. Uh, yeah, I think we've talked about No Man's Sky to a great length before, um, saying that you can often pick it up for $10, $15, $20 to $30. We talked about it, like, I think two episodes ago, where we actually went yeah. to go online, where we were looking at the updates. So, where, where it was cheapest. It may have even been the last reader mail, I actually can't yeah. remember. I think that they did a, a huge misstep in the launch of the game, but then they've kind of rectified it by continuing so the back of the continue of the support of the game and of course free updates. So while it was pretty a uh, pretty bad thing to do, uh, they felt like they did somewhat of a better deal by fixing it all. I would agree. I would say that at this point, uh, even looking at the stuff for beyond the new update that's coming out, it's to the point where. I don't, I really don't see, you know, even after the first update, you still saw a lot of naysayers who were just kind of like, you shouldn't have launched the game this way. I essentially don't see any of those comments, even on Twitter and all these other places that tend to have people who comment crowd and jump and just say stupid stuff like this. I'm very surprised. I think they've completely turned themselves around in public opinion and that's great. Yeah. So. They did a really good job of making that game over for what it should have been. Um, yeah. He also put this top 10 thing or questions to know your friends. I think he put there as a joke because he even said more seriously. Um, so I don't think these are actually questions he wants us to answer, but there's one that I really like. He says, uh, where did it go? Oh my gosh. Are eyebrows considered facial hair? <laughs> I assume they are, but uh, thank well, you Matt for that. Let us know if you actually do want us to answer those. I'll go back and I won't delete this tweet, but I'll go back and get these. Uh, we can answer them the next episode. Um, because I can't tell if that's a joke or not. But uh, Richard says, how come Saul is not excited for Days Gone since you play as a good old boy and Saul is a good old boy because he has that KFC accident? <laughs> Probably an autocorrect from accident, but you got that KFC accident, Accident, boy. yeah. I don't know what the accident was. Uh, I mean, I'm just... You ate KFC and suddenly your accent became so much thicker. That was the accident. Yeah, KFC you, literally, you had the bucket in your hand and you, you're like, boy, that damn finger licking good. No, nah, they have the famous bowls. That's what you get. <laughs> You don't get the bucket. I'm dead serious. Like if I, I go know. to KFC, I'm eating the famous bowls and like three biscuits. And, I know we've uh, had this and conversation. A, and a Pepsi. Yeah, good good times. But I mean, I am. I mean, I'm I'm not really excited for it. But I'm 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 excited for it in the same way that you're I was, lukewarm on it. It's the best way I've. Yeah, been. like I, I'm gonna get it eventually, but yeah. it just looks 
the same as all the other games that are coming out lately, like in terms of I don't, open world. I, I don't zombies. blame you in the sense that you, essentially what you mean is it seems uninspired to you. Yeah, it just seems it just seems like it's more of what I've played a hundred times in the past. So yeah, and I and I've said a many a times I I stand on such a different thing. I can clearly see why some people may just kind of be like, eh. A lot of my excitement towards the game and hype towards the game only comes realistically from the pedigree. I don't care for zombies that much. I tend to avoid yeah. games that have zombies unless they do a really interesting take on them. Hopefully this game proves me, you know, proves me wrong. And it is a really interesting take with these freaker things. I mean, I really hope so. Uh, but the rest of it is, I just, I really like studio bend and I want to support them. And I know that they make good games. So regardless of the story and everything else, even if everything else fails me, I think the game will be fun. And that's enough for me to at least feel good in, in offering my support at day one. Yeah, but Saul doesn't have that same attachment pedigree. to that pedigree. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, it's it's just, it's, yeah whatever. It's, it's all just personal stuff, personal preference. You know, I mean, it, who knows? It may. What does it come out? April twenty third, something like 25th, that. Twenty fifth, seventeenth, like maybe. I can't remember. I don't think it's seventeenth, but you know, if it comes out and there's just not a whole lot that I'm doing, like um, if I'm still not playing Sekiro because I try. Anytime a, uh, a Dark Souls game comes out, I try to play it once as one way, once in another. Uh, Which April is 26. that going to be as possible on this? Yeah, actually, there's uh, you could do classical builds in this game. Okay. Since you can, uh, well, never mind, I'm not going to say anything. But uh, okay. just for people who haven't like played it yet. But yeah, you could do classical style builds in this game. Not traditional style builds like you can in Dark Souls. Yeah. But more of like tree selections and stuff. Okay. Yeah. But I uh, let's see. Liam has a joke question. He says, will the digital only games people eventually move on to having a poop pan? If changing my game disc is too much work, I can't imagine the turmoil they suffer to get up and go pee. Essentially, this is their next step, right? Oh, absolutely. Hold that's on. The, that's the only reason I'm going to all digital. I really, you, I, I, he, I know that he's bullshitting, but he's also being serious in the back end. He's just trying to point out the ludicrousy of the argument that it's just, oh, I don't want to get up and change games. It is, of all of the arguments, it's the weakest argument. It's still my favorite because it's the truest for me. That's fine. Literally, I mean, there's more space in my room for more cool things. But are you advocating for other people to do it because of the, your reason? I mean, I would tell them it's now, a plus. Like, you could advocate for other reasons. Like, well, you own the game forever. You can't accidentally trade it in. Well, there's a lot of things. That, and then you know, the you new- can't, nobody can steal it. I actually talked about that the other day. I was talking to somebody about Titanfall because Shuk- uh, Shoko got the um, Titanfall 2 plat. And I was like, yeah, I, I was aiming for it. And then I put it down a little bit because I was frustrated with the run. And then it went missing. Think about it. If I own the game digitally, you can't no steal happened. a game. Well, and what's you cool know? about it, too, is that when you think about it, you don't have to access your disc. You can put your PS4 in different areas around your living that don't that wouldn't really make sense. or That would be like hard to put like in a certain way for your disc. I was trying to think of a new desk setup that I'm doing, and I was like, I was going to have my PS4 vertical on this side of the desk and then have my speaker over here. But then I was like, well, you can't really see my speaker system that well. I'm literally going to have my PS4 vertical up behind my monitors. I'm never going to need my disc spot for it. So I don't know that you've and we're using monitor arms for your setup. Yeah. So I know that, but uh, I actually ran across something the other day that's essentially it's a it's a Vesa V E S A the, the mount. Uh, it's a mount for your either you can put it on the wall or it has Vesa holes so that you can use the the holes in the back of your monitor or your TV and you can mount it there and then slide your PlayStation in and it holds it. Do you like do you, where where? I can show you. I have to, I have to look it up again. But it's a little black metal bracket, and it's made just thick enough that you know how the PlayStation. You can get one for the Pro, and it takes the bottom ring of the Pro, and it the the little thing slides around, and you slide it in there, and it holds the Pro. I might do that then. See, yeah. and like I would, and it yeah. literally stays on the back of a TV. The, now that would mean that you would have you could do it on the wall though, and it would still just be a wall mount. Yeah, I just don't know if you can mount into your wall since you're at an apartment. Uh, I mean, yeah, technically I can. Uh, it just, I lose. It. That's it right there, right? And you, then you would just mount that onto the back of the Vesa bracket that's on the TV. Yes. The monitor. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not that hardcore with it, but, you know, if I didn't have disc to worry about, that's totally more plausible. Because if you mount it on my, the, the TV I'm going to mount it on, uh-huh. it's going to face the opposite way. Yeah. And so, see what happened. The only reason I even ran across that, and this is another example of why it's good for certain people. A guy said he put his PlayStation up there behind his TV, attached to his TV, because his kid would open the door that it was in that didn't have good ventilation the anyway. the button or the and, power button. Well, he's, yeah, he just messed with stuff. Yeah. So he's like, you know, it's a lot easier to pull it up and not have to worry about my stuff going missing. And he even said, I might even go all digital so that it being back there has no no problem. Like, I don't even have to worry about it. Yeah. I don't have to change disc. It's just... The only thing is hitting the power button, which, you know... Or, well, technically not behind the TV, but... Yeah. 
Yeah. Last question on Twitter. Matt Green says, look at PSVR releases coming out. I'm tempted to get one, but is it worth waiting for the PS5 and, and hopefully for a wireless VR headset? We're not going to get a wireless VR headset for the PS5. I don't know of a system that works really, really well with that's the also a, a episode seven question. So you're just terrible at, <laughs> at figuring out where these are supposed to go. But I'm we're going to answer it. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess you get this on sneak peek. So, so sorry, technically, Matt. I would say this. Sean says that, but no. I don't, if I don't, if you would have been able to grab it when it was two, and I don't know if this happened in the in European areas, but when it was two hundred dollars, I don't think it did. That dude, that is a steal, and it there's is. no yeah, reason it, that you anybody who had a, even a modest interest in it when it was two hundred dollars. Hopefully did grab it up, and I bet so because the system went from three million to four point two million pretty quickly. Yeah, and that so was probably one of the leading reasons. The, why. These sales definitely help get these numbers up there. Uh, but I think if you have a real interest in it, and it's more than just what you think is a fleeting or passing interest, my first suggestion would be to just try it anywhere that you can, anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. We literally went to Dallas, like which is about three, about two hundred and fifty miles away from us. Yeah, roughly. It, essentially, it's three hours. I mean, that's yeah. the best. That you, and we literally drove there one morning uh, to try out a demo unit at a yeah. GameStop. So. And that's because Saul and I were both kind of on the fence about it a little bit, but we were both kind of interested. But the thing about it is, four hundred dollars day one, you don't want to spend on something that may make you motion sick. And you kind of got to yeah. know these things. Yeah, you so. got it. Like I would honestly try it out just to see if you get motion sickness. If you know you're good at that kind of thing, I wouldn't worry. Um, and even then, some of the motion sickness can be learned away from. They call it getting your VR legs, and it is a it is a thing. Yeah. Brett, um, take us to our last question that is on uh, YouTube. We have, we have two on YouTube. We do. Yeah, one is from Mr. Brian Ford. Oh yeah. And he says, "Hey guys, was looking for a gaming podcast and found your channel. I like to listen to the episodes while I'm at work and I've been loving every episode, especially the viewer mail ones." Yeah. Uh, one you. question though. You guys were talking about how Capcom's been killing it with RE2 and DMC5 and also uh, going back even further, Monster Hunter World and Resident Evil 7. Uh, but what about my boy Mega Man? Mega Man 11 pretty much put faith into its fan base that the series isn't dead and could have a bright future. Just wanted to ask out of curiosity anyway. Thanks for the episodes. Thank you for asking questions, you. man. Anytime you, you want. Words. We appreciate it. We're glad that you liked uh, the show. Uh, and we're really glad that you liked the reader mail because we know that this is not, reader mail is not necessarily for everybody, but there are subsects of people that really like it. And actually, it doesn't do bad. We get about, about we get about views. 75% of our viewership on the normal episodes on these. Yeah. Now, this is YouTube. We get about 30 views, but we get around 200 to 250 listens on the, yeah. on the reader mails, surprisingly. So, to answer um, your question, though, I haven't played Mega Man 11, and I'm a fan of the series. Uh, that's going to – I might end up just passing on it entirely just because uh, I don't have time. You know, there might be uh, a stance in which between there's – I don't know. There's a lot of stuff coming on the Switch that I might buy, but I do want to get it on the Switch. Um, but Seems like a good home for it for you. The, the yeah. way that you play those types of games, it's, it's a lot like me. If I Mega love, Man 11 would have been on the Vita, I would have already had it. Stuff like it. Axion Verge, Silver Knight, Mega mm -hmm. Man, Castlevania. That stuff, that stuff is my favorite on handhelds. But yeah, I do think that I'll eventually get it. But it's because it's, it's my backlog. But yeah, I agree that, that Mega Man seemed to have a pretty, I'd say about 75, 25 percent uh, love hate it. Where yeah, seventy five percent loved it, and twenty percent, twenty five percent, they just did not only dislike it, they just hated it. Yeah, and I'll say it is important to talk about what Mega Man Eleven did because it was a budget game, which is fine, and it was made very differently, and it introduced two point five D to the series and all these different things. Uh, but, and this is very important, Mega Man Eleven is is, is a milestone for the series after you saw what happened because very easily Capcom could have said. Look how bad Mighty Number no. Nine did, and just off of numbers alone, it would not make sense for us to invest in Mega Man because Mighty Number no. Nine is essentially Mega Man from the Mega Man creator. I'm gonna go to the restroom, and it just ruins it. Um, and that's one of those very interesting things. Um, if you want to read off, or continue reading off. Yeah, no, you're fine. I'll just finish answering this one. But yeah, I get what your point too, and I think Capcom has been on a really good steal lately, where they've been killing it with franchises that people have loved for a long time and have known for a long time and one that they have literally, none of it's been new IP. I do wish I could see them kill it with new IP, but in terms of giving them, giving faith in their long running IP in comparison to someone like Konami, which has done very, very much less uh, with its beloved IP, you know, the Castlevania IP sits unused. Uh, the last entry 
that was new, people were pretty eh on. So when you think about it in that sense, and the last time that they used Metagross Solid was with Metagross Survive, which also didn't seem to do very well, um, at least in terms of opinion across fans, it makes sense that people are really appreciating that Capcom is taking the time to make a great, or at least as far as they can get, great uh, and even taking chances on making Mega Man 11 after seeing how bad Mighty Number no. 9 did. So that's one of the things I would say. Uh, and I hope they keep killing it. They really stepped their game up randomly. It kind of seemed out of the blue, but their graphics are just top notch lately. Their games have been looking beautiful. Uh, for I mean, honestly, Monster Hunter World looked beautiful in a number of ways, but the way that they portrayed its world was the number one thing. And the small details was great. Then you see Resident Evil 2, and it has its killer killer environment i mean they just they knew what they were doing with that game uh, and they made sure that everything in the game looked very presentable uh, in a way that surprised me honestly again after you see what they did with what they call the resident evil one remake which was hardly a remake realistically it was essentially making the base game look pretty it, it was a it was a glorified remaster in a lot of ways but it technically was a remake um but what they did with that, I mean, that went above and beyond. It rescoped some things. It was essentially more along the lines of a remake in the Ratchet and Clank series. So I appreciate and applaud all their moves in that direction. I hope they keep it up. Uh, Mr. Saul is coming back, so I'm going to go ahead and read the question off so he can hear it. Let's see. It's World Ends. Uh, little video viewers got a, a little Saul strong hand. Uh, let's see. World End says, question, with the surprising and false rumor that Sony is trying to buy Take Two and Sean Layden saying that they are open to buying studios if, quote, their culture matches Sony's worldwide studios, end quote, what would be some realistic studio acquisitions for your Sony or for Sony that match their culture? Do um, you have any immediate answer that you think of? No. I have, uh, I have technically two. I think that we've seen a number of, and I guess technically three, we've seen a number of people that obviously f work well with Sony and job well with Sony that have been in the, the second party thing. Uh, I think that Sony has worked very well uh, with Square, Ready at Dawn. Uh, and the thing about Ready at Dawn is before, and it's unfortunate that the order just hit the way it did. The order was Sony's take on show us that you can make a great game. And I honestly think if the order would have done massively successful, they might, they probably would have bought ready at dawn. Um, it's unfortunate that it didn't happen that way, but ready at dawn had a huge history of Daxter God of war. They, they were very close with working on Sony's beloved properties and doing a really great job at putting them onto a handheld. So letting them go up on this new thing is like, well, we know that y'all are talented and y'all can really push the technological boundaries of this handheld. Show us what you can do on a console. And I think they achieved on the technological boundaries part, but they didn't necessarily achieve on public opinion and even they, and there's flaws in that game. There just is as much as I love it. Um, but I still think that if you, I don't know if you've seen uh, Santa Monica, which was involved with Ready at Dawn, working with them on the order um, through their little X Dev style thing. When they were doing that uh, here recently, they sent a version of the, uh, uh, oh God, I can't think of the game, the Arc Gun, I think is what it was. Uh, I can't remember if it was the Arc Gun or the Thermite Rifle. I can't remember which one. But it was one of the Nikola Tesla designed guns that were an exclusive gun. Uh, Santa Monica sent it to them uh, on the anniversary of the order, uh, which was really cool. And I think that there's obvious work that the studios around there like each other. And Ready at Dawn have a lot of talks about where they had people from other Sony studios coming to them and asking them how they did certain things. So I think the culture definitely lines up. They had a good relationship with Sony and a lot of good relationship with other Sony studios. I think they'd fit right in. Um, Unless Microsoft scoops them up like... Um, Ninja Theory? Ninja Theory, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think Ninja Theory was a good answer for something that would have fit in with Sony. Uh, sadly, honestly, they, I mean, they didn't have the same kind of relationship. Their, their only real relationship with Sony was, was with Heavenly Sword, which was tumultuous. Yeah. What, so, was, what was your second one? Uh, the second one was, I, and I still think, Supermassive Games. Um, and it doesn't seem like the jury's completely out on that. I would have said... I would see that I happen. would have said Quantic Dream, but... We obviously know that Quantic Dream didn't go that route. We don't know no. why, yeah. but they had a great example of Sony funding games they wanted to do, even with Beyond not doing near as well as Heavy Rain, they still let them do Detroit, which was a massive success for them. Uh, so a smart move on Sony. Uh, so it's one of those, I think that Quantic Dream would have been a great answer, but that's kind of gone. And I think that if you're going to try and get something that's along the lines of Quantic Dream and that have proved themselves to be able to do it. Uh, I think Until Dawn has been a great answer uh, for that. And it was a sleeper hit. And it's very similar to, I think, what happened with Ready at Dawn. 
it was a it was a, a little connection to make an exclusive that did so well and really pushed technological boundaries that they were impressed. And I wouldn't still put it past the fact that that still could happen eventually. Yeah, I would say Square Enix would be cool to see. Well, Square's th- that's one of those interesting things when he's talking about this. You know, the surprising and of course false rumor that they're going to buy Take Two. Um, it's Is that crazy. Really surprising though. Sur- well, surprising in the sense of. Sony's going to acquire an entire publisher that has multiple developers. Well, I'm saying it's, it's surprising that it didn't happen. Is that, no, is no, he's, he's saying? saying surprising, like the fact that people even put it out there. Is oh, okay, so that, so okay. it's, it's surprising I, people would even. I agree to with it. you then, yeah, because yeah. I don't. I, I never thought that was going to happen. That never would happen. And it was very similar. Do you remember the EA Microsoft situation that was going on, where people were saying that They're Microsoft was going to acquire EA? Some degree, but yeah, the, I, well, I can well, see that more so than this. Well, right? really? Because Take Two has got a better relationship with Sony, just like EA recently has had a better relationship with Microsoft. That's what I'm saying. I could see them. I could see Microsoft uh, acquiring EA before my, or before Sony acquires Take Two. No, I think they're both equal in that sense. No, Take Two and Microsoft, I mean, Take Two and Sony have had a great relationship. I mean, I'm not saying the same. I'm just saying like what, like I would think that EA is more, uh, more comparable to a buyout than than Take Two would be. Well, they're more compromised because their public opinion is bad. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, yeah, that's exactly why. <laughs> yeah, I but mean, I would like to see Square though. I mean, traditionally things like, um, even though technically it's platinum with Square, but Near coming out doing the best on PlayStation, and then most Square games for the for for well, Japanese Square games, I, say yeah, for sure. I want to say a higher percentage of of JRPGs or J or, J or Japanese action games that come out from Square that are games that are either on PlayStation and PC or just on PC. I mean, are, are just on PlayStation. When they do go to PC, they typically have a lot of problems. They just need, they like, just like, even though I'd, I'd hate saying that because I hate taking games away from people on PC. So like, I don't really like these questions because I don't really. It's not. I don't. I don't care because it doesn't. It doesn't affect me. It's kind of where it's. That's why the fun answers and, and the ones that seem plausible in a way that doesn't seem harmful to others is ones that like, you know, you can reasonably look at Sony and say, okay. Ready at Dawn and Sony have a great relationship because they've done it. They've done it back and forth, and it's not like Ready at Dawn have been putting out a bunch of multiplayer games. Take two games on the other hand, though. Love. Yeah, take two on the other hand. That would literally like, I, and there are people who don't like. I don't think it's r- r- necessarily right to punish people because they're not they don't agree with a way a business thinks. And when you almost like a monopoly would would be a very close example of what that would be after take two. What else would you? What else would no, you even dude, buy an it, Xbox for? Well, no, I mean, essentially, what a monopoly means is that the competition would have no means forward. So right. if I'm they did that, that realistically, then at that point, Microsoft could buy EA and then Sony could be like, well, we're going to scoop up Ubisoft. And then Microsoft would be like, fine, we're going to buy, I mean, whoever. Regardless, Activision, we're going to buy Activision. Massive. Uh, they, they are. They have a lot of really great properties. But, I mean, that's saying, saying they're massive, I mean, Activision's still bigger. Really, yeah, but name, know, the, name the IPs you would gain with Take Two versus Activision. Oh yeah, you'd gain, in our opinion, more valuable. But realistically, in sales, I mean, Call of Duty happening every year and breaking sales, or you know, in literally breaking sales records and being the best selling game. I of guess the year. that is true. Yeah, Call of Duty is something. Activision For some would reason, be a, a, a. I still equivalent to their own personal developers instead of publishers, such as um, what is it, Sledgehammer, Treyarch. Yeah. And those but, are those are in house developers. So, yeah, um, that's one of those interesting things. But or at least I think they are. They they're all owned. And then Ghost Games. I mean, you gain Need for Speed, and Need for Speed sells a lot every year. And actually, that would be a good way for Sony to beef up their racing games, uh, since they don't since they got rid of their one their other racing game studio. Uh, you know, Sony. I mean, Microsoft right now has the Forza Horizon team, and then yeah, they also have very, the Red Forza team. Very so, strong in terms of racing. Games. If Sony could do that, but let Polyphony be their main racing team for the simulation style game. Yeah, but even and then, then let Ghost Games be their developer There's for their other racing games. still a lot of t- bad feedback on Need for Speed. I mean, just based on the system they had with the card system. Yeah, that was the only downside of that entire game. Yeah. Uh, well, the microtransactions made, were in there. Well, the, the microtransactions were tied to that. Right, that's what I'm talking about. That's yeah, like the, but, that's, but they weren't necessary. I didn't spend a dime and I never had to. It was just a weird way of... It stifled progression in a way that felt like it was up to random chance instead of the exactly. other Need for Speed games being like, oh... I'm just gonna go here and I'm this is the this engine I want. This person to get this engine or to get. Well, this no, it, it's that you get that much money. It's like, well, no, I, oh, I, I, I won my races. I well, got my money. No, because there's sometimes their parts are locked behind certain things. Yeah, not always, but they, yeah. they, they have been. So yeah, you're right. But yeah, like it's a that, different like, progression wall. But yeah, I mean, I can't it's think, fun of, to think about. But seriously, I don't think I'd, I'd like honestly like from a 
business, I, I would say Square would be the smart choice for me. Now, his question is realistic studio acquisition. So right. realistic goes towards the ones I mentioned. I, and the third one that I was going to technically mention is that even though they've said they're not going to, so this is still technically not realistic in the sense of I'm fairly positive Insomniac is doing their thing. But as far as realistic in the sense they would work together and if they did want to sell, I think Insomniac would do very well with Sony. They have a great relationship with them. Yeah, they already have a good pass with them. Yeah, I mean, a great relationship with them. So, I mean, so, it's just... It's just one of those things that, like, I don't really... I never think about this kind of thing. Like, when, when this movie's business acquisitions happen, I'm just like, well, that was out of the blue. Like, it's been in a talk well, for a month. I just don't care. Th- and there are ones that are out of the blue. If you would have asked me this question, I would have never, ever said Ninja Theory for Microsoft. Ever. I still don't even think it's a great fit. I, it makes no sense to me, but they did it. Well, so I'll we see whatever's going to happen. That's the yeah, thing. exactly. We may see, and, and the thing is, is even well, see, though that's it, the problem with us, though. That's the problem with our standpoint, is that it might not have been great for, for us. That's great for all the employees that still have their jobs. And oh, now. yeah, yeah. But See, that's why I don't like these kind of, these kind of que- or not questions, but I don't like this mindset as, like, being the consumers that we are. Like, it, it's, it's a weird game to play. And yeah, I hate for I, somebody who worked for them to ever listen to us and hear us say that. Well, no, I mean, and I don't mean in a bad way. I'm going to support their games and still play them. I like Ninja Theory. I, I do too, it. but I'm just saying like, so, I mean, saying and I'll play them on PC. I'm, I'm not mad at them. No, I mean, I, I know, I'm not even mad at Microsoft. It just seems like an odd decision. Right. On both parties. Yeah. Microsoft really didn't have a good relationship with them, and they didn't have a good relationship with Microsoft outside of just being a thir- third party, well, this, their games being released third party. That's why I think, if anything, Square for me is the one that makes the most sense just based off of sales of Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy being on PlayStation more so than on Xbox. And then yeah, the that's, just that, a, that's just a really large scale acquisition. Oh, yeah. It seems very odd, but also, I know something that would have never happened. <laughs> that will never happen. Yeah. All right. That was the last question. So there we are. Until next read and mail, I guess is episode seven. Yeah. I got, seven. I also screwed around because I had this dog I found. I didn't put the read and mail question up yesterday, so I will do that tomorrow and get back on track for the read and mail submission post. But this has been Triangle Squared. So until next time, and technically Triangle Squared read and mail, thank you. Thank you, guys.